Good morning, Keelan. Please call the roll. Good morning. Ryan. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Wheeler. Here. We'll now hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. <coughs> Your testimony sh should address the matter being considered. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you. First up is communications item number 294, please. First Re individual. Request of Joan Steinbach to address council regarding Southwest Capitol Highway Island intersection. Good morning. How are Good you today? Morning. Well, how are you? Excellent. Any chair? And if you could just state your name for the record. And just, just to be clear, are all three of you testifying or just one yes, of you? Yes, all three. And yes. are you signed up to testify, yes, all we three have done of that. you? Mm -hmm. So are we combining testimony? Is this also Peter Tolan yes. Baker? Okay, um, so may I read the next two? Terrific. So um, uh, would you like two minutes each or just a total, or excuse me, uh, three minutes each or a total of nine minutes and you can figure it out however you want? We plan for three minutes each, so I think, Perfect. I think we're. Hopefully we're gonna be okay with that. Yeah, so. no, that's not a problem. Good, okay. I just wanted to make sure that, that it comported with the agenda. All right, good, thanks, okay. welcome. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll read the next two um, and then we'll get started. 295, request of Peter Tolan Baker to address council regarding unpermitted use of amplified sound. And item 296, request of Petey Farkas to address council regarding impact of amplified sound in Multnomah Village. Thank you, thanks for being here, appreciate it. And I'm speaking first, so. Yes, perfect. Ready? Okay. Good morning, council members, Mayor Wheeler. My name is Peter Tolan Baker. I own JP General in Multnomah Village with my husband, Jay. I join two colleagues today regarding a matter that we have been pursuing for the past two years in which we need your counsel on. I am here today on behalf of Multnomah Village Business Association and our 100 plus members. As the current board president, I am proud to represent a diverse and dynamic range of businesses that include many BIPOC, LGBTQ+, veteran, and women-owned businesses. We are a strong organization actively involved in our community residents, local nonprofits, and various departments within city government. And many of you are familiar with Multnomah Village's unique history and setting. In addition to events, MVBA provides a variety of support for our businesses, community, including how to manage <coughs> increased levels of vandalism, shoplifting, and persons experiencing mental health crisis, doing our part to ensure a healthy, safe environment in the business district. Starting two years ago this spring, we began having weekly demonstrations by two individuals that have a noted history of encounters with a variety of city departments. Carolyn and Renee Stevens, local residents of nearby Maplewood, staged their demonstration using a small traffic barrier island at the key intersection in the heart of the village. This approximately 200 square foot space is considered city property, which the Stevens are knowingly using for their setup that usually includes a large banner with disturbingly graphic images, an amplifier, and large speaker. For over an hour, the Stevens will use the amplifier at full volume to disrupt and harass the village via threatening and intimidating language that includes hateful commentary towards a range of people 
and communities as well as perceived injustices. But we're not here to discuss their demonstrating. We are here because of the unpermitted use of amplified sound and subsequent disturbing the peace with intent to disrupt, which thereby is having an increasingly negative effect on our businesses, our residents, and visitors. The amplifier volume has been measured on multiple occasions at 85 plus decibels, far exceeding the legal limits set by the city and impossible to ignore. I have personally made efforts to discuss the level of sound with the Stevens on more than one occasion, as have other community members and business owners. Each time the Stevens responses were quite aggressive and threatening. We have spent valuable time and resources on trying to address this issue, making calls, attending meetings, and commuting with a range of city departments. We feel we have exhausted our efforts to get this matter addressed and request your support and guidance on the following. One, enforce existing ordinance as specified in Title 18 City Noise Control Code. And two, ensure citations and penalties are not dismissed at district attorney level as has happened in the past. You will now hear from my fellow MVBA colleague and members, starting with P.D. Farkas, owner of Peachtree Gifts. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is P.D. Farkas, and I own the gift shop Peachtree Gifts in Multnomah Village. My store has been in Multnomah Village for over 10 years. Thank you for the opportunity to hear us today. As the others have stated, this issue has affected our community in many ways. I'm here to talk about how this affects both the business and restaurant community, even the neighborhood house food pantry serving the families in need. One aspect that makes Multnomah Village so special is that many of our customers live in a five mile radius. Due to this, they are very tuned in to what is happening in the village, which means that on Wednesday, they know to stay away. Now, can you imagine a business having to survive with one less day? One less day to support our employees, one less day to pay our bills, one less day to make rent, and one less day to support our families. We are calling on our representatives, you, to help us. It's not a surprise that Wednesday has now become so slow, and this is consistent with the other stores and restaurants. In fact, our fellow committee member, Helen, from the beloved Fat City Cafe, shared that one time as many as six, yes, six tables left during lunchtime due to the sheer volume and harsh language of the protesters. Customers could not hear each other speak, and the servers could not hear the customer's orders. Many people also still do not want to eat inside due to the pandemic, and we appreciate the opportunity to have outdoor dining, but it is becoming impossible. Will these customers ever come back to the village? What will they tell other people of their experience here? Why give other people more reasons to go eat or shop at big corporate restaurants and malls? We have also witnessed many people becoming quite volatile toward the protesters, and this worries me as to where it will lead. Can you please help us end this toxic situation? Why are our rights not being protected? Where, where are we going with this? As businesses, we respect the freedom of speech. We respect that in a business district, opinions may vary, and we respect discourse and open communication. However, this is not about that. This is about a law that is being broken, and it is negatively affecting our ability to conduct business in our city. I urge you to consider this. What is stopping another group who has a grievance to decide that they too want to amplify their thoughts? Can you even imagine what would become of Multnomah Village if this occurred on a daily or hourly basis? We can't afford to set this type of precedence with people seeing that there are no repercussions for disturbing the peace and breaking the law that the city of Portland created in the first place. I sat down yesterday and wrote a quarterly tax payment to the city of Portland, and it gave me pause. We are doing all that we can in our power to stay in business and supporting the city while we do so. As the stewards of our city in which we give back through employing citizens, paying permits and taxes, and creating community, we ask that you do all that you can do to help us. We are here today to request that you refer <coughs> this day's case to the district attorney's office and work swiftly to help us with this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Joan Steinbach, and I'm the owner of Thinker Toys, which is located directly across from where the Stevens have conducted their Wednesday amplifications for almost two years without fail. So we have had front row seats to this weekly event. Their amplified grievances, which are well above the noise ordinance level set by the city council, the noise code is, and I quote, 
intended to control the level of noise in a manner that promotes health and common good. It works to reduce unnecessary and extreme sound in the environment to preserve the use, value, and enjoyment of property, conduct of business, and more. The Stevens have been cited violating this ordinance and it has not been enforced despite various actions that our community has taken. Their demonstrations of 40 to 80 minutes at this extreme volume have caused, tr caused tremendous stress and anxiety for all of us working at our store. We have been targeted by them, called out at different times as child haters and racists, perhaps because we have asked them with sensitivity, I might add, on several occasions to please lower the volume and or refrain from using profanity. Customers too are aghast this is, that this behavior is tol tolerated. Some children have been confused and scared, particularly those with sensory integration challenges, and so far from preserving the use, value, and enjoyment of our environment, the city permits two individuals to continue to amplify their issues in the public space, which supersedes the common good of our larger community. Over the past two years, I and other members from Multnomah Village have spent hours of personal time doing everything we've been told could possibly end these amplified intrusions. We filled out online forms, intended a virtual meeting with the noise re review board, and as advised, made weekly phone calls to report the broadcasts. Personally, I have emailed and or had phone conversations with a variety of city employees from the Office of Community and Civic Life, Portland Environmental Management Office, the Noise Review Board, and the Portland Police. Additionally, I have left messages um, with the mayor's office at least three different times with no response. We have a clearly defined city ordinance that has been and continues to be violated. It seems the city has the right to levy fines and to put an end to this unhealthy level of amplification. We would strive to preserve, preserve the use, value, and enjoyment of the many and not the loud, unlawful broadcasts of the two. We do not want to control their right to free speech, just their volume that violates our city code. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I will most certainly have some follow-up comments, but I'd like to defer first to Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to thank you for your testimony and uh, want to say that um, you may or may not have known this, but the noise program has just recently moved into my portfolio under the Bureau of Development Services. Um, we are very aware of the situation. We're, we're, we're paying attention um, and we're actively working on it with our um, the city attorney's office working together with the DA's office. So just want you to know that we're taking it seriously. I can't comment more deeply on that because it's it's an ongoing investigation right now, but um, I just want you to know from me we're, we're taking this seriously. Thanks. So I'd, I'd like to put my personal credibility on the line here. I've reached an age where I just don't suffer BS anymore. They're taking advantage of us. Mm -hmm. They're hiding behind their First Amendment rights mm -hmm. to cause harm to other people in the community. Mm -hmm. And as the commissioner just indicated, this is a very difficult issue because it does touch on First Amendment issues. So we are progressing carefully. But I also want you to know this. I asked for an update this morning. It is my understanding that they have been cited repeatedly as per law and what is allowed in terms of enforcement under our noise codes. And they don't care. So the next step is to ask the question, what can we do from a criminal justice perspective for people who are in violation of the law and simply don't care or don't respond to the existing fine structure? We are working with the district attorney. I completely empathize with your position on this. I've said very controversially, and I've gotten bad press nationally for saying this. I'm gonna say it again because I fundamentally believe it. In my heart, I believe rights come with responsibilities. And what we have here is a classic example of where this group is trying to test us. And what they're saying is, we have our rights. And we're gonna exercise the rights but what they don't understand is their rights are now conflicting with the rights of others. And that's the challenge of government, is to figure out how do you mediate between two sets of conflicting rights. But for me, the bottom line is this. 
Um, they are in violation of our noise ordinance. I'm not speaking to the content of their speech. Unfortunately, as I've learned over the years, people are allowed to say the most reprehensible things and the core of free speech in the United States is the tolerance of all speech, even reprehensible speech. But the fact that they're doing it, as you say, in an, ele in an elevated way that is uh, demonstrated to be harmful to people's hearing and uh, public health, uh, that's problematic for me. And they're daring us. And to go one step further into the rabbit hole, they're acting like jerks. Mm -hmm. And it makes me angry as a public official that I have to spend as much time as I do on this, and my staff has to spend as much time uh, babysitting people who just don't want to work well with other people in the community. So uh, I will just say vociferously, I empathize with your plight and we will do everything we can to stop it because it's not fair to the community. So thank you for being here. I'm sorry you had to take time out of your busy days. Uh, go to Multnomah Village. It's awesome. There's some amazing <laughs> things to do and see and great people there. And we really appreciate the hard work you put into Multnomah Village. I know it's gone through such drastic change in recent years with development and, and growth, but you really manage it exceptionally well. It's still a jewel in this city. And I, I really want to do everything I can to work with you and support you and, and help make it a place where everybody can coexist peacefully. Thank you. Um, before we leave, is there anything that you recommend that we might continue to do that would help you as you also um, you know, take our costs? Probably, um, and I'll, I'll defer to Commissioner Rubio on that. Um, if you want to reach out to my office, I, I know my staff is here somewhere, Jimmy. Um, he can be in touch with you and talk to you offline. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks really for being here in person. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, I believe we're t next individual 297. Thank you. Request of John Carter to address council regarding lighting and parks. They canceled their request. They canceled their request. Uh, and 298, please. Request of John Oncharski to address council regarding lack of parking enforcement. Welcome. John. Is John in person or online? Yeah, John was going to join in person. Is John here? I don't see him, and I don't, let me just check online one more time here. Uh, look at the attendees list. I don't see him, so he must not have shown up. All right, good. Uh, we'll move to the consent agenda. Have any items been pulled off the consent agenda? No. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted to the first time certain item, please. Item number 299. Except Division 0 2022 Deadly Traffic Crash Report. Commissioner Mapp. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Portland Bureau of Transportation. We're about to receive PBOT's Vision Zero Deadly Crash Report for 2022. The Vision Zero Deadly Crash Report is published every year. It provides policymakers and the public with information on traffic deaths here in Portland. And it makes recommendations on steps this city can take to make our streets safer. Colleagues, in my role as PBOT Commissioner, I re represent this council on many transportation planning committees. It is traditional to begin those meetings by reading the names of Oregonians who have died in traffic accidents since the last time our committee met. Colleagues, this council has served together for a little more than 100 days. And in that time, 13 people have died in traffic accidents here in Portland. Their names were Ronald Brown, age 35, died while traveling in a motor vehicle. Penny Griffith, age 68, died while walking. Tyler David, age 44, died while traveling in a motor vehicle. Mary Mark, age 64, died while walking. John Zrobski, 59, died while walking. Toby Fowler, 54, 
died while walking. James Pinkerton, 34, died while traveling in a motor vehicle. John Mulkelwan, 54, died while traveling in a motor vehicle. Jason Todd Clark, age 46, died while walking. Jonathan Gilkey, age 41, died while traveling on a motorcycle. In addition, one person died while walking, we don't know that name, and two people died while traveling in motor vehicles, and I do not have those names with me today. Colleagues, these losses are unacceptable. We can and we must make Portland's roads safer. Today, we will hear a presentation on the steps this council can take to reduce traffic deaths on Portland's roads. Here to tell us more about PBOT's Vision Zero Deadly Crash Report for 2022, we have Dana Dickman, Traffic Safety Section Manager with PBOT. Welcome. Thank you. Again, I'm Dana Dickman, the Safety Section Manager with PBOT. I'm here with Deputy Interim Deputy Director Wendy Cauley to share a little bit about what we know about what happened in 2022 on our streets with fatal crashes. Give us a little bit of safe systems grounding, the approach that PBOT is taking to eliminating fatalities, and talk about our priorities, where we're using the data to um, inform our practice and inform where we're making investments on our streets. So I think, are you moving the presentation forward? You have it in front of you, so I can just talk through. Just again, that's that, that's what there we're we working for. You can actually go to um, two slides forward. Thank you. I just want to say how much I appreciate being in person here with you all. I'm getting I'm getting used to it again. <laughs> it's been a couple of years since we've actually had a chance to all be in here together talking about Vision Zero. I want to say that Vision Zero remains our goal. As Commissioner Mapp said, no, not even one loss of life on our streets to traffic violence is acceptable, but the safe system approach is how we get there. The safe system approach is a multidisciplinary view of how we approach traffic safety. It's not something prescriptive that tells us exactly what the Bureau should do and what the city should do but it very clearly elevates safe completed trips in our discussions about priorities and about trade-offs on our system, and it lowers our tolerance for risk. I wanna bring it up and talk about it a little bit today because you've probably been hearing about safe systems in the national discourse. It's something that we at Peabody and in the city have been focused on since we started doing the work over five years ago, but now FHWA and our federal system has also um, committed to the safe system approach to eliminating traffic fatalities in Oregon and across the nation. Next slide, please. So we wanna really um, take a minute to ground ourselves again once we get to that next visual. These are the 63 people that died on our streets last year. These were sisters, friends, spouses, children, Certainly they lost their lives, but it also impacts people well beyond these individuals and continues to impact um, our city long after the crash. We ground ourselves in this work every day and our partners that work um, across the city and across the state on Vision Zero and eliminating fatalities. Next slide, please. You're gonna see a graphic that uh, gives a five-year trend line for traffic fatalities. You can see as we came into the pandemic in 2020, we've seen traffic fatalities rise. Um, I'll show a little bit of a graph later that also shows that this is not just unique to Portland, but is combined with some of the impacts that we're seeing um, from the pandemic and increasing traffic fatalities um, across the board. Next slide, please. The next graphic uh, illustrates the total number um, of crashes in, across that five years again, but I'll call your attention to the fact that we uh, document all fatal crashes in the city. Um, some of our peer cities around the nation only look at the traffic fatalities that happen on the roads in their jurisdiction or, or city-owned roads. We look at all fatalities of folks who die on our streets, um, including those on ODOT streets and counties. 
streets. Well, we believe it's really important to understand the entire picture of what's happening um, and work with those partners to uh, change street design and improve safety across uh, the system. I'll also call your attention to that last line, high crash network. Um, we can see that 8% of our streets consistently uh, account for more than half of our traffic fatalities, and last year it was 70% of our traffic fatalities were on just 8% of streets. So again, um, 2022 essentially told us that we need to continue to focus in these areas that we've already highlighted as a great need. Uh, next slide, please. This data shows a data just through 2020. Um, most of you have heard this before, but we have a slight delay in when we get data from ODOT that has the complete picture of serious injuries and traffic fatalities. In our safety program, we're looking to eliminate both fatal crashes and those that have um, life-altering serious injuries involved. And we, I share this because it does show that we're seeing a decline in overall injuries a steady decline. Uh, 2020, that number that shows a precipitous decline, uh, we believe that some of that might be underreporting, but overall we're seeing a decline in those serious injuries and feeling um, that some of this data shows that we are having an impact. I want to share a little bit of good news as well, not just um, that we have had those high fatality numbers over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. Now I want to dive in for a couple of minutes to the specific trends from 2022. Again, we have that 70% of traffic fatalities on just 8% of our streets in Portland. 45% of the traffic deaths were on streets with speed limits of 35 miles per hour or higher, really emphasizing that issue around speed and the ability to avoid crashes or avoid them being fatal. 44% of our traffic deaths were pedestrians, vastly overrepresented in our traffic fatalities. Four people died while bicycling, and speed and impairment continue to be dangerous and contributing factors, and we've seen that escalate during the pandemic. That's something we've seen since we've been looking at the data starting in 2015 when we became a Vision Zero City, but has continued and exacerbated during uh, 2022. Next slide, please. Our 2022 death toll matched the previous three decade high. So we had 63 fatalities in 2021 and 63 fatalities in 2022. 74% of those traffic deaths and 93%, almost all of our pedestrian deaths, occurred in low light conditions. Uh, houseless community members were also overrepresented this year with 19% of the traffic deaths and 36% of uh, pedestrian deaths while they make up only less than 1% of the population in Multnomah County. We also had 25% of our crashes with vehicles running off the road, so roadway departure on streets like uh, Marine Drive, Outer Foster, places where we have more rural conditions, but it also happened in streets where we wouldn't expect for that to happen, like Inner Prescott. Um, so that is a concern of where speed and impairment is intersecting. And we had an increase in overall hit and run crashes with 27% of our crashes uh, involving a hit and run condition. Next slide, please. I wanted to share the overall traffic death rates in Portland as compared to Oregon and the national statistics. Portland does tend to be lower overall. We are doing a better job on safety on our streets. However, you can see that those trend lines are mirroring as we come out of 2020. The trends that we're seeing with so the, the highest number in three decades is also happening at the statewide level and also happening nationally. And I flag this because we recognize that part of what's happening on our streets is, pan, is part of the pandemic impact. The, the anger, the depression, the things that people were experiencing with job loss and all of those things are also um, impacting behaviors in the right of way. And we're seeing that um, across the country and in Portland. I flag it again because it is a multidisciplinary issue. We can't solve um, traffic deaths without thinking of the bigger picture and all of the things that are intersecting um, in our right of way. 
Next slide, please. So I want to ground us a little bit before we talk about our priorities in our safe systems guidelines. Safe systems is a little bit different than the traditional approach. The principles are that people make mistakes that can lead to crashes and that as the uh, transportation authority, we need to recognize that and ensure that those mistakes are not deadly. The second principle is that the human body is incredibly fragile and has limited ability to tolerate crash forces. So what that means is we can't expect urban streets that are multimodal to accommodate 45 or 50 miles an hour and, and expect that we're not going to have serious or fatal crashes. We can't continue to have those um, design standards or that type of behavior and expect to have different outcomes. A third principle is shared responsibility, that in order to have a safe system, in order to eliminate traffic fatalities, that responsibility is shared between people who use the system, but also those of us who design and operate the system, and that it really needs to be a um, comprehensive <laughs> approach with that shared responsibility. The fourth is system redundancy, that if one part of a system fails, that you need to be providing other, like a, the comprehensive system, so that um, all parts are strengthened and we may el eliminate a fatal or serious outcome in a crash. We know we're not gonna eliminate all crashes. We're trying to eliminate those most serious outcomes and the loss of life on our streets. Next slide, please. I'll just move a little bit more quickly through some of this. This is just a graphic that shows how the safe system approach is a little bit different than what we would traditionally have thought of as traffic safety. You see in the traditional, uh, in the bars there, that there was a huge emphasis on individual behavior and very little emphasis on safe vehicles or on street design. In a safe system approach, we sort of swap that and say that there, there's definitely a role for individual behavior out on our streets, but a lot of the burden is on designing streets for safety and designing streets for the behavior that we want. Next slide, please. So how does, it, how does Portland use a safe system approach in our lives and achieve our goal of no lives lost? This graphic shows sort of a holistic approach being needed to addressing traffic fatalities. If you look at the, the section that is orange, that's major street designs, safer speeds, that's really PBOT's body of work. That's, where, that's what you think of when you think of traffic safety. That's the things that you see out on our streets, the changes, some of the programmatic work we do. The teal, freedom to get around without driving, that's some of the multimodal work we do. That's a big part of what PBOT is working on and we know that an increase in VMT almost directly correlates with an increase in fatal and serious crashes. So those two sections of this graphic are really where the Bureau of Transportation has the most influence or ability to change the dynamic out on our streets. But then we have a whole other part of this graphic um, that isn't our kind of sphere of influence. Basic needs include things like access to housing, access to substance abuse treatment, access to education and jobs. Those pieces are really critical and when we don't have the services in place to help people, some of those issues are playing out in our streets. You are, are all very well aware of all of the issues, but those things intersect and influence whether or not we're having fatal or serious crashes out on our streets. And then I'll just add people-friendly vehicles. Um, recognizing things that can be done outside of our sphere of influence, but around um, high visibility cabs, uh, uh, interlock systems on vehicles to help with impairment. That's not something that we directly work on, but all of these things are needed to achieve our goal of zero lives lost. Any questions before I move on into kind of our priorities? Okay, uh, next slide please. I just want to talk very briefly now about some of the ways we're using that safe systems grounding, the data that we have from 10 years, the data from 2022 to focus our work. That's designing safe streets to protect human lives. Again, really focusing on protecting pedestrians because we can see that we have a, a huge uh, kind of disproportionate amount of pedestrians that are dying on our streets. Reducing speeds 
citywide through a myriad of different um, tactics and then creating that culture of shared responsibility. Next slide, please. Within these priorities, we also look at um, broad data from 10 years, and this is, these are just a couple of data points from the 2022 data. A majority of the traffic deaths in 2022, 61% occurred in areas of Portland with high equity scores. PBOT uses an equity matrix that looks at um, people of color and low income and shows where there is a greater proportion of those folks. We see that our um, fatal crashes are happening in those areas more often. I'll also call attention to East Portland. 42% of our traffic deaths occurred in East Portland last year, and that accounts for just about a quarter of our population. So we're looking at those priorities of protecting pedestrians, designing streets to save human lives, but we're also looking at where we need to prioritize to um, support the most vulnerable folks in our city. Next slide, please. This is an example of how we're doing major street design changes. Um, in East Portland, we have many streets that were designed in a time when their kind of sole focus was to move folks long distances across that area. We now have those streets that serve people working along them, going to school, living along them. They're very different urban corridors than they were when they were built out you know, 30 or 40 years ago. We recognize that we need to change these streets to very much bring speeds down and adjust to that different situation that's out there where people are using them in all sorts of different ways. This is an example of an intersection at 148th and Division. I just wanna call your attention to the separation that we're providing for people biking and walking, knowing that we still have high volumes of all modes coming through these intersections. We're trying to create that separation and that clarity for people at these intersections. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we have a number of corridors where we have a five lane configuration, two travel lanes in each direction, a center open turn lane. This graphic really shows why that situation is particularly problematic for safety. That number of 22 that you're seeing on the top of that graphic, that's the conflict points that we see in a typical kind of turning movement on a five lane cross section. Below is the number of conflict points when we add a median or kind of reduce the access to that open center turn lane. So you can see just in that very simple illustration how changing the dynamic on that corridor can really reduce risk for all people using it. Um, we also recognize that things like left turn movements on these particular corridors because of that graphic that you, with the 22 conflict points, 20% of our crashes involve a left turning vehicle and that's with all modes, that's pedestrians, vehicle, vehicle, bicycle. We know that that particular movement is particularly challenging on these five lane cross sections. Next slide, please. I wanna elevate some work that was done to help us win a $20 million federal grant to work on 122nd. And the point I wanna make here is this is a culmination of multiple years of work and leverage with fixing our streets dollars. We had planning, engagement, education that has been happening for multiple years out on 122nd. And we also have a planned investment of $5 million with fixing our streets dollars for 122nd. And that allowed us to be successful in that grant application. So again, this focus on East Portland, this understanding of how we need to change streets, the continued work that needs to be put in to allow us to then leverage the federal funding and the Safe Streets for All federal grant that we just received. Next slide, please. We're also doing very tactical projects, not just corridor redesigns. These are things that maybe all of you have seen in different neighborhoods. This uh, photo is of left turn traffic calming. Mention again that we know that left turns can be particularly problematic for safety. This is a small intervention, those black and yellow bumps that you're seeing slow people down in their turning movements and align the vehicle so they can better see pedestrians and other vehicles at the intersection. So we take the data, we're looking at 
high crash intersections across the city, places where we know we have configurations that might be causing risk, and looking at tactical interventions as well, not just the big street transformations. Next slide, please. I'm gonna focus a little bit on pedestrians quickly. Um, within the pedestrian data specifically, I'll mention the fact again that 93% of our fatal crashes in 2022 were in low light. Over 10 years, that's about 50% of our crashes are happening in low light. We know we need to make a system investment and increasing visibility across our streets. We know particularly in East Portland that we have limited lighting on many of these large corridors. So that's a place where we're really investing that lighting will help everyone, but it will pr be particularly helpful in these fatal crashes. I'll also call attention to a couple of other points here that 71% of our fatal pedestrian crashes happen at uh, intersections. I think there can be a narrative out there that it's an issue of pedestrians just crossing willy-nilly. The data does not bear that out. The data says we need to look for ways to make folks more visible, provide options for people, and create that separation and clarity. Next slide, please. So one of the things we are doing is really focusing on opportunities to create that clarity and separation. So that means adding pedestrian head starts. These are at signals at where it gives pedestrians a few seconds to get out in front before the signal changes, provides more separation and clarity, adding protected left turns so we don't have people having a green to turn at the same time as a pedestrian is walking um, and also has a signal, and then increasing the prevalence of marked crossings, refuge islands, medians, things that are really supporting that uh, clarity for where people are supposed to be walking and can do so safely. And I, I want to reference going back to some of the data around um, houseless pedestrians in the last two years that all of these interventions will help everyone, including um, those most at risk out on our streets. These are changes that will um, improve the system overall for anyone who's accessing the right of way. Next slide, please. We also do a significant amount of work and have a focus uh, on reducing speed citywide. We have a comprehensive speed management strategy that includes setting safe speed limits. We have done work at the legislature to give us more local authority. It includes redesigning streets to slow speeds, including not just the high crash network, but doing neighborhood traffic calming to slow speeds in the city overall. Uh, with a focus on schools and access to other community spaces. It includes educating Portlanders about the impact of speed. Many of you have seen multiple campaigns that we have done over the years. And enforcing the speed limit with both cameras and collaboration with uh, the traffic division at, at the Portland Police Bureau. Next slide. I'll just add here that we while we have a focus on street design, we do believe that education and that creating a culture of shared responsibility is a big part of something that we can all do. Um, and so we have focused media campaigns. We have new work specifically with high schoolers through our Safe Routes to School program and Vision Zero program. And we do a lot with our police partners to pair enforcement and education and focus on the dangerous behaviors. So with that, I'll wrap up and just say that um, the next time we come back to you, I just want to preview, we will be bringing an updated action plan in the fall that will have information about where we want to focus through 2025 and also more information about what we know is working, some data and evaluation on projects that we've done out in the corridors to just uh, give you more information about like the good news about how Vision Zero is uh, moving us forward. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Colleagues, questions? Commissioner Maps, you. Um, I'll have a closing statement, but uh, uh, John, thank you, staff. I have no uh, questions right now. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Ryan. Thank you for that report. I just have one question around measuring. So before you do construction, you have information on safety, and then after you do construction, what are we seeing in those um, reports, and where could I find them? 
We have a Vision Zero webpage. I can send you the link to that has some uh, projects. One of the challenges that we have is that delay in crash data that you saw earlier. So we need about three years of crash data and we have a delay in getting it and then we need about three years to be able to tell what really happened on a corridor. So some of what you'll see in our reports is we're measuring speeds. So we can easily do before and after speeds on a project. We do see a decline both from um, capital projects, our cameras, we, we've documented those speed reductions, so that's part of what you'll see. And we do have some projects where we have enough crash data um, where you'll be able to see that drop that's in the, crashes. The crash and data yeah. that you're looking for. Yeah. And you mentioned behavior change, so I think that that's probably what's gonna reveal is having drivers change behavior is not easy. It's just, it's not easy to change behavior from adults in general. Yeah. So um, it'll be interesting to look at that data and then ask questions um, to see how we can improve. Because this started in 2015 and, you know, the numbers aren't great. <laughs> yeah. And so we wanna make sure that we're learning and if in fact we have to readjust. Have there been any readjustments since it's began? Um, we've done pilot programs where we have, we had one on particularly on center turn lane, uh, kind of disrupting that and we uh, installed something that didn't quite work for folks in East Portland. They were getting run over a lot. So there's been more small adjustments like that where we've tried to implement something, realized it wasn't the, um, the design wasn't working. Um, but in general, the trends haven't really changed. Like I said, we still know we need to focus on protecting pedestrians. We know that our high crash network and those streets continue to be the issues. Our high crash intersections are predominantly in East Portland. So we continue to focus on that work. Um, unfortunately, major street design changes take time and as you all know, can be highly controversial. Um, so that's work that we need to continue to do and kind of stay the course to see those changes. I hear Behavioral that. I just changes. think it's really important to admit that I, I'm, I'm okay with failing. It's, to, it's, it's noticing that you are and then having the courage to make adjustments. Yeah. So I just want to know that we're looking at the data as it comes out and that if we need to make adjustments, we are. I just can't tell if that's a practice right now. Yeah, we are a deeply data-driven program. I don't know if you want to speak to anything on the evaluation piece, Wendy, but it is like very much ingrained in what we do is evaluating what's working, what's not. As I said at the top, Safe Systems is not a prescriptive formula. It doesn't tell us exactly what we need to do. And so we are in a space where we're trying things, evaluating, and then updating if thanks, we need Jane. to. I or appreciate that. Points. I just want to make sure we're looking yeah. at both what works yeah. and what doesn't work. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I, I will just say one thing. As, um, before my interim deputy director appointment, I was the city traffic engineer, and I've been working in safety since I started at the city in 1997, and we started doing um, safety projects. I mean, we've been doing them all along, and before we were a Vision Zero city, we had a high crash corridor program that started in around um, 2010. We have a lot of data from some of our road diets that shows very promising crash reductions. And so the safety work that we started in the early 2000s is, uh, you know, it has had benefits on our system. So just some of the more recent projects that Dana has, um, has mentioned, we are still waiting for that data. But yeah, we are very heavily um, data driven and we are doing evaluation. So happy to come back and share some of our yeah. newer project evaluations. And why before, just one more thing. I think we've, you've heard there's controversy. And so the people who live along division have been here quite a few times. I spent a couple hours there, I don't know, about a year ago. What's the dialogue been with the small businesses out there who seem rather consistently upset with the changes that took place on division? I think there's ongoing dialogue also with other community members, um, partially re reminding folks and giving folks more information about why the design is the way it is. We can't expect every community member to be a traffic engineer and to understand. And when we do go out and explain, um, Folks typically are um, very supportive. I think there will be con there will need to be a continued dialogue. It's a lot of change, and we're doing it at a time when there's a lot of change for community overall. And so we recognize that that's part of our process is that we have to work with community through that change. I'll just say again that we recognize the need for transformational change to these streets in order to have different outcomes. We can't 
keep doing the same things and expect different safety outcomes. Thank you for so, this report. Yeah. And I hope like in a work session, Commissioner Maps, I appreciate your leadership on this, is looking at when we make a decision to do all the changes on the major thoroughfare or when do we decide the greenways may be a parallel street next to mm -hmm. it. That's what entered my thoughts when I was out there. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez. Uh, thank you so much for the comprehensive report. Um, just could you walk us through the process for engaging and incorporating the feedback from first responders on uh, traffic redesign? And the background for this is I get repeated uh, concerns raised that some of our choices on meridians, no left turns, uh, speed bumps negatively impact the response time, particularly of our larger first responder uh, vehicles. And may you just walk me through high level how you take into you know take into account response times. So, and then it's obviously a trade off, right? On speed um, and free mobility, on the one hand, um, leads to higher traffic um, uh, accidents. On the other hand, it also allows first responders to promptly respond to emergencies. So, just maybe walk me through the calculus and and how you engage there. Yeah. I can, I can speak to that. So um, this goes back into the 1990s uh, when uh, I first started here. Actually, before I started here, we had a very um, uh, good partnership, and we still do with Portland Fire Bureau, but back in the 90s, we set out uh, to set up which streets were minor emergency response routes or major emergency response routes and determined at that time that we could, uh, the fire bureau agreed that if it wasn't a minor or a major emergency response route, then we were free to put in traffic calming, whether that was speed bumps or other measures. Um, over time, we, we realized um, we had a very robust traffic calming program at that time, but we also realized now we need to start getting into addressing neighborhood collectors, some of the higher volume, higher speed streets as well. So we um, have a memorandum of understanding with the Portland Fire Bureau that we will check in with them on these higher classified routes that are used for emergency response. And so they have a chance to review our designs when we do traffic calming or um, diversion projects on those routes. And there have been in times when they've said, look, this is really too critical, uh, you know, we're not going to support um, speed bumps on this facility, or they say, no, we, we believe that, that we can manage um, uh, a, a difference in, in response times if there were to be one. We've also developed a fire-friendly speed cushion that does have the cutouts. If you see speed bumps with those cutouts, the, the cutouts are um, constructed to allow a, a fire engine to pass through without having to traverse over the speed bump. So they're not slowed down as much as a, a, a typical passenger vehicle or a truck. So we have worked with them on that design. We continue to refine that design um, uh, because we have had some comments in recent years that maybe it's not working as well as it could have. Um, so we are in, I, I would say we have a very good relationship with uh, the Fire Bureau to, to talk about these types of things. Got it. And, uh, and I, I have been meeting follow with Commissioner Maps on one aspect of a, a recurring theme I hear from rank and file is just some of the choices about the width of the uh, curb cuts on the speed bumps uh, and uh, also the spacing with meridians. I couldn't cite the specific streets where that comes up, but um, I'll, I'll, someone on my team will follow up with Commissioner Maps to make sure we get the feedback that uh, and do with it what we can in terms of uh, your bureau and the fire department continue to engage in proactive conversations there. Um, I think that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you for the comprehensive report. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, so I was really, thank you for the presentation. It was very, very informative. I was really struck by the statistic about 70% of the traffic deaths occur on 8% of the streets. And in that map that you showed us, it looked like there was a high percentage in East Portland. So it makes me um, you know, think about um, community that lives in East Portland. And I'm very curious about how you are engaging uh, multilingual communities in, in particular. And uh, could you share more about that? For Vision Zero specifically, I mean, the, the Bureau is doing a lot of work on relationship building with community-based organizations, with different folks that are serving um, like 
multilingual um, residents in East Portland. But for Vision Zero, one of the things that we um, have been doing is working directly with different folks impacted on these corridors in their language. As an example, um, Guerras Latinas was re very concerned about some of the changes on division. We have a long-standing relationship doing pedestrian education, doing walks with that group. So we went and did um, a specific presentation to them in Spanish about division, about the, de the design de decisions that were made. So it's both high level, like safety education happening with different community-based organizations, but then also responding to requests and sort of co-developing um, resources, education, information with them like based on what their specific needs are. That's great to hear. Yeah. Do you have um, multilingual capacity in the engagement team itself? Yes, um, it depends on the language, of course. Um, and certainly if we don't, what we do is we then partner with a community-based organization and pay them to provide that interpretation support. So in some cases it's been something like a, um, a PBOT employee will develop a presentation, then work with the person who's able to give it in the language in advance, and then they're there to give interpretation and, and share during it. Or, of course, we're also doing translation. We don't have you know, every language that um, folks are asking us questions in on staff, but we have ways to accommodate that. But do we have them at least in the major languages, some basic material? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions. First of all, great presentation. That was actually very interesting. I learned a lot. Um, left versus right. That one threw me uh, a bit of a curveball, no pun intended. What are the conflicts to the left, particularly? Is, is it oncoming traffic? Where, where, where is the conflict actually it's happening? It's kind of all. That graphic actually shows pretty well that there's all of these different places where you can have I mean, you have to think about it. Maybe, maybe you as the engineer should describe this better. I often say yeah. if we all went 20 and just went right all the time, we'd already be at zero. Okay, and, right. and, and, I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute too. Yeah. Um, I, I actually thought it was right-hand turns that were killing pedestrians and bicyclists, but that, that doesn't seem to be supported by the data. Right hooks can be a particular problem for, um, for cyclists, but the data bears out that we're having a particular problem with left-hand turns, and it's across all modes. So this is also for people driving, for people walking, for people biking. That, that Do you want to explain the really like, nuances of the? Yeah, I mean, just uh, left turn um, crashes are often at a higher speed because if you're waiting for a gap, you know, in traffic that is coming towards you, you're looking not only at auto traffic, potentially the bike lane next to it, and then any pedestrian that has started crossing the street over here. So you're, you're monitoring multiple things, and then you're accelerating to get your turn done. Right turning, you're slowing down to make your turn, so oftentimes those turns are at slower speeds, so don't have um, as dramatic of a, a result or injury impact. So that's just a, a couple of the things that make left turns a little more dangerous than, than right turns. That's interesting. It's not to say we don't have to be concerned about right turns. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. uh, of course, that's yeah, right. and I didn't want to imply that. I, I just found that particularly uh, interesting in the report because it, it really wasn't what I expected. And, and so I appreciate your highlighting that. Um, some cars, I am, uh, I rented one not too long ago and had a blind spot detector. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how accurate they are and I wouldn't bet anybody's life on it, but I wonder as that technology comes online if we're gonna start to see fewer of these interactions that you described, do, do you sense that or do you hear this when you go to your national conferences or read the journals that you read? I think anything that can be improved for safety and detection outside the vehicle, not just safety inside the vehicle, can possibly have an impact. That's part of the overall picture of safe systems is making vehicles as safe as possible. We haven't necessarily seen that the, in the data that shows that detection is yeah, reducing pedestrian fatalities, yeah. but um, am I supportive of that type of um, change to vehicles? Yeah, I think it could have an impact. Yeah, it's just a thought. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, you mentioned lighting. 
And you mentioned that a lot of the uh, areas that are particular hot spots are areas that are poorly lit. I assume you have identified and then prioritized those areas for additional lighting. Is, is that a fair statement? Yeah. Great, I, I appreciate that. Um, also the national trend. I'm always interested in these trends and it almost weirdly um, intersects with some public commentary we had on a completely unrelated issue earlier today. But I'm told that just nationally, we're seeing more and more of these types of interactions between autos and autos, autos and bicycles, autos and pedestrians. And it seems that speeding is a common element, as you just indicated. What's going on here? I mean, if I knew that, I could probably. <laughs> but I, I think what we've speculated about and we talk about on our team is that we're seeing the impact of the pandemic, like I said job loss, depression, like all the things that have happened as part of the pandemic are contributing to people acting in various different ways, including being angry and aggressive behind the wheel. Like those things that we're seeing in community overall are those things that, are, that we're feeling everybody brings to their driving. And so if, when I talk to peer cities across the country, everyone's seeing an increase in top end speeding, like things that are well above what we would consider the norm. We're not talking five miles above, we're talking about 80 miles an hour on residential streets. Like every single city has stories like that in a way that we didn't four or five years ago. We may, but it was an anomaly, not something that we were seeing regular. I don't know exactly why, but I think it is a breakdown of social and cultural um, issues that have happened as a result of the pandemic, and it's all playing out in our right of ways. So, so let me ask you this, because th this is a tough one for government, right? Um, we're approaching this very much from the engineering supply side, the solutions, the, you know, the, the right of ways, the signage, the lighting, the warnings. Um, the, 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 the sidewalks, the dividers, but really what's going on here is a behavioral shift. And we in government don't like to talk about behavior because it starts to sound like we're regulating people in their, their daily lives. And that's an uncomfortable place for government to be. But I feel like there is more we could do in terms of informing and encouraging the public to really adhere to those speed limits. They're, they're there for a reason. And we're losing way too many people as a result of, and, and I, you know, it, it, it's horrible. I mean, who wants to kill somebody? I mean, that's just because you were five minutes late to get to the dry cleaner or whatever. It's not, it's not worth it. Are there things we could be doing? You know, we, we started with our 20 is plenty campaign and, and I'm told that actually had some success and, and there's, there's other things we could be doing, but do, do we overtly think about behavior and shifting behavior and informing the public, all of us? I'm not saying it's us, for, it's all of us. I mean, I drive too. Is there more we could be doing on that front? And if so, what? Yeah, I, I just wanna say, I feel like safe systems kind of leans into that discomfort around the connection, like that shared responsibility, recognizing like that first principle is that humans will make mistakes like we're flawed, people will make decisions to speed, people will make decisions to drive impaired, and part of what we do on the street design part is to change the streets enough so that those poor decisions are not fatal. But I do think on the speed management piece, it, if we kind of go back to like, we have this multifaceted approach where it is street design, it is posted speeds, it is enforcement, but also education. So yeah, I, I do think that there's, an increased emphasis on um, education and outreach in the coming years that we maybe haven't had. One of the things that we're doing is really leaning in with new drivers. We have not had a focused education program for high schools in the past, and this is in collaboration with our Safe Routes team, but really leaning in with our youth on the impact of speed so they, they really understand um, that you know going a few miles over the speed limit could have it a much greater detriment than they've been sort of led to believe. So we are kind of leaning in both, and like I said, Safe Systems doesn't shy away from the behavioral aspect of it. 
as the Bureau, we invest a lot of our work in the street design pieces, but we also do the outreach and the media conversations around speed. Yeah, and, and that's a really good point because the, the, the math and the statistics are a little bit surprising. I mean, just a little more speed can actually lead to a, a nearly exponential increase yeah. in, in injury and fatality, and that, that's a bit of a mind bender. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about how large vehicle size um, is changing that dynamic. So the increase in the overall fleet that people are driving, um, that speed that people can go and not have it be fatal is reduced if you're in a, big, a bigger vehicle. So we'll share a little bit about that as well. There's a lot of intersections there. And anything here on uh, that, that we can discern around texting or cell phone use is it, speeding is obviously the major component, but I'm, I'm also hearing distracted driving is a significant component of this. We still don't see it in the data. You don't see it? Interesting. No. Okay. Um, I hear yeah. it all the time. When I ride around the city, I see people <laughs> on their phones all the time, but we're still not seeing that in the, the data that's showing that that's having a dramatic impact on fatal and serious crashes. Good. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. This very, very good report. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, do we have public testimony? No one signed up. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? second? Commissioner Ryan seconds <laughs> the report. Any further discussion on the report? Seeing none, please call the roll on the report. Ryan. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Thank you, team. It's good to see you in person as well. Yes. Uh, I just hope that we continue to be humble and look at the data and learn from it and make adjustments. There's a lot going on. <laughs> it was fascinating, just the last question about distracted driving. The data doesn't show it. <clears throat> That's hard. I, I, the whole room was kind of like, you know, there was a reaction to that. It doesn't mean it won't eventually, but right now that we don't see that. Yeah, no, got it. I'm just under, saying that. Under, and then navigation systems. I mean, you're, it's like 9 a.m. and you're like, is that person impaired? No, they're, and when it's in the summer, the window's down, you're hearing them listen to the robot, tell them which way to go, and they're confused. Mm -hmm. So there's so many layers to this. Mm -hmm. And when they're listening to that, they're not looking. So anyway, obviously I enjoyed the give and take and the questions and answers that we had today. It's a great dialogue. This is complex, and we obviously have a long way to go, but thanks for your focus. I accept the report. Gonzalez. Hi. Maps. Um, I want to thank PBOT for their work um, in the traffic safety space, and I want to thank my colleagues for the really rich uh, dialogue that we had today. Um, as the commissioner in charge of PBOT, improving traffic safety is one of my top priorities. Colleagues, the uh, goal I am trying to manage for for the net very short term, as in the next year, is to reduce traffic deaths by 10%. I think that we can achieve that through some of the strategies that we heard today. But in order for us to implement those strategies, I will need your cooperation, both in set of po setting policy and prioritizing uh, traffic safety as we set budgets. Um, in the meantime, I look forward to continuing this work and this dialogue with my colleagues on council. I vote aye to accept the report. Thank you. Rubio. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Maps for his leadership on this, um, and thank you, Dana and Wendy, for the presentation today. It was, it was really compelling to me and uh, really important to, that we hear that information. Um, I also uh, appreciate um, hearing all the names of the people that lost their lives. I think it was important to name, uh, read their names into the record. Uh, because they had full lives here, and, and we're this is this is what it's about. Um, I'm a fan of the safe systems approach. Um, I think it is a, a good shared responsibility model, um, and we have, as government, have you know a lot of ability to impact design and speed. Um, it's also incumbent on us, though, to ensure that we're getting uh, the word out and engaging with communities that are harder to reach as well. So I appreciate. Um, the efforts that you're making there. Um, so it was just great work, and I look forward to hearing more about your action plan in the future. So happy to vote aye. Wheeler. I, I found this to be a really great report. I appreciate the, the data uh, focus that you're bringing to the table, because it did have a couple of surprises, and it'll be interesting to see in coming years just how that data shifts, or if that data shifts. Uh, I will just say I, I appreciate the focus uh, that PBOT and Commissioner Maps under your leadership on safety. Uh, I will just put out there openly that I am somewhat skeptical that engineering solutions alone can overcome human behavior. I think all of us 
who choose to drive, myself included, have a responsibility to really think about what we can do in terms of our individual choices to help solve this problem. Uh, infrastructure is very, very expensive. Personal responsibility is just a matter of making a choice. And so if there, there are ways we can help support and incentivize that, great. I'm also supportive of the engineering solutions that you've brought forth. And I appreciate that you're going down to the fine grained detail that sometimes you don't have to rebuild an entire intersection. Maybe if it was lit better or if the signage was different, there's, there's other ways that we could potentially reduce those conflicts. Uh, we didn't really talk about homelessness today, and I, I didn't want to necessarily take us into another very robust <coughs> aspect of this, but we have to note that 70% of the traffic fatalities, pedestrian fatalities, were people who are living on our streets. And 50% of those are on ODOT right-of-ways. And so I appreciate the partnership that we uh, have with, with the governor and the state to do what we can to reduce those conflicts and reduce those pedestrian deaths as well. And I want to give PBOT credit for continuing to follow that uh, and work with us on that strategy as well. I'm happy to vote aye, and the report is approved. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next item is another time certain. This is item number 300. This is a presentation. Uh, Commissioner Maps, I take that to mean we will not be taking a vote on this item. We will be hearing this item. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Very good. Present 2023 Portland Harbor Community Involvement Program Grant Awardees. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Environmental <laughs> Services. BES is here today to announce the 2023 Portland Harbor Community Involvement Program awardees. Now here's some background on these awards. Many people do not realize that the city of Portland, the state of Oregon, and our federal partners have embarked on one of the most ambitious river cleanups this nation has ever seen. This cleanup focuses on the Willamette River from roughly Sovi Island uh, down to the Fremont Bridge. This project is known as the Portland Harbor Superfund Cleanup. Now, when this cleanup is complete, the Willamette River will be cleaner than it has been in nearly 100 years. The Portland Harbor Community Grant Awards, which will be unveiled today, support this cleanup effort. The Portland Harbor Community Grant Awardees, which will be announced today, were chosen by a diverse panel of community and government representatives. The Grant Review Committee awarded $481,837 to nine community organizations. Many of the programs and projects receiving awards today are led by communities of color, which have been directly impacted by pollution in the Willamette River. Uh, today, I believe we will are, are honored to have three community groups um, who have received awards who will address council. Uh, they'll share a bit, little bit about what their organizations do. Uh, but in the meantime, let me first begin by uh, turning this presentation over to staff. We have Jessica Terlikowski, a coordinator with the program, and Annie Vonberg, a manager with the Portland Harbor program. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Hello, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you so much for having us today. My name is Annie Vonberg, and I am the Environmental Remediation Manager at the Bureau of Environmental Services. I'm here today with Jessica Terlikowski, our Public Involvement Coordinator, as Commissioner Mapps said, to provide you a brief presentation um, on this year's grant recipients. And uh, we are uh, very lucky to have three of those grantees with us today to provide a little bit of background on their organizations and what they do plan to use uh, the funding for. I'll note, uh, you either have received or you will soon receive uh, from the council clerk a summary of the great work that was done in last year's grant cycle. We won't be going over that in the presentation today, but we do encourage you to take a look at that. And with that, there's also a one-pager with a little more detailed information about the awardees this year, a little bit about their mission, and a, a more about what they plan to spend the funds on. We won't be going into a great level of detail today because of our time constraints, but that's there for your information. So uh, next slide, Thank please. You. So as a reminder, the Portland Harbor Superfund, it's a federal cleanup site. And as the commissioner mentioned, it's a 10 mile stretch of the lower Willamette River. 
uh, there is contamination, problematic contamination on the riverbed. And that's as a result of over 100 years of heavy industrial use. The city is uh, one of over 100 uh, uh, potentially responsible parties, or commonly referred to as PRPs. These parties are responsible for addressing that contamination in the riverbed. After 20 years, the Superfund process is now in the environmental remediation stage, which is really exciting. It's a very important step right before we actually get in the water and clean up this contamination. EPA has told us that we are uh, looking at getting in the water and doing that work as early as summer of 2025. So we have a lot of really exciting things to look forward to. Next slide, please. So community involvement is a really essential part in the cleanup process. Uh, it elevates community voices in a very complex process. As Commissioner Maps mentioned, this is one of the most complicated sites in the entire nation. So it's important for our local communities to have voices in that process. Uh, we don't control the process. This is an EPA-led site. So it's really important that our local community understands and is a part of how that cleanup happens. Community involvement also supports transparency. It's really important to make sure the community understands how the process works, how they can participate, and how they can track cleanup progress as we move forward. And also, really importantly, it builds trust with the community. Uh, this, is, this is a tough process, and we want to make sure that uh, as we move forward, there will be billions of dollars invested in this cleanup site, and once we get to completion, the river's not going to look much different than it does now. So it's really important that our community understands the process, they trust the process, and they trust the work that's been done to make this area a protective area for human health and the environment. So with that, I'll transfer it over to Jessica. Great. Thank you, Annie. Good, good afternoon, commissioners, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you all today about our Portland Harbor Community Involvement Program grants. Um, next slide, please. So before I provide an update on the, on the grants program, I'd like to just start by acknowledging the time and effort and advocacy that resulted in this program becoming a program in the first place. There's a number of community members who've been working tirelessly to make sure that the city is doing more to invest in communities so they can, they can effectively participate in this process, and we wouldn't be here without them. I'm excited to share that we continue to advance each of the goals um, that are on this slide, which were developed in response to feedback and a collaboration with many community members several years ago, four years ago. Um, particularly those that are disproportionately affected. Our program includes a few different components. We educate the public and about the cleanup through events and workshops. We collaborate with agency and community partners to hold intentional conversations between technical professionals and community members about the cleanup design at Willamette Cove. And we have a focused grants program, which we feel is one of the most impactful components of this overall effort. Um, and I'm going to focus the remainder of my presentation on that piece, on that community grants program. Next slide, please. So the central goal of the Portland Harbor Community Grants Program is really to increase Portlanders' awareness and understanding of the Portland Harbor cleanup process, particularly among those communities that are disproportionately affected. And when we're talking about disproportionately affected communities, we're talking about Portlanders with current and cultural and historical connections to the area, um, including BIPOC communities. We're also talking about housed and unhoused people who live near the site, as well as people who eat resident fish and shellfish. The grand objectives that we have for this program evolve with every step of the cleanup process. Um, and the slide here with those uh, green bubbles uh, circling the, the larger blue bubble um, are those different categories of objectives. So we're actually gonna be focusing this year's funding on increasing and expanding participation and leadership and capacity building of those affected communities in the process, engaging and educating communities about the Portland Harbor Superfund topics, everything from health risk communications to how the process works so people can effectively engage in it. Um, we also have funding that is, is supporting uh, environmental career remediation, uh, workforce development. And finally, investing in the development of partnerships and strengthening, strengthening those partnerships with 
both community groups as well as with government entities to really build capacity and foster collaboration to ensure that we're elevating community voices in these process. Next slide. So community members are active in each stage of, of our grants process, and this includes the review committee. Um, Commissioner Maps mentioned that we had a, a number of uh, was a hybrid of community members and of um, government uh, representatives. And these folks were selected based on their knowledge and experience related to the affected communities, their knowledge of environmental justice, the Superfund, as well as effective community involvement in equitable grant making. They assessed how the applications were aligned with the program goals, the role of the Superfund affected communities, and making sure that the outcomes and impacts of and the benefits from these programs would be uh, benefiting those communities in particular. And then they also conducted conversations specifically with a number of the applicants to learn more and provide another opportunity for applicants to share in their own words uh, what their vision is and how they can best reach their community about these topics. Next slide. So our program is really committed to providing the necessary support to applicants and to the reviewers throughout our process. This includes us doing extensive outreach to spread the word about the funding opportunity, as well as helping potential applicants understand what makes for a successful application. To this end, we've conduct, we conducted substantial uh, direct engagement through phone calls and emails and meetings. Um, we wound up engaging nearly 200 individual community and government contacts to help spread the word, and those contacts helped to amplify the opportunity even further out. Uh, we provided a couple of information sessions, help people understand the application, the process, um, as well as provide any support as we go on through, through their application. And most community groups that applied for funding and attended one of the info sessions received funding. Next slide. And so our collective efforts resulted in these nine organizations receiving awards. The review committee used a consensus-based decision making to determine grant recipients and the award amounts. And after a lot of deliberation, they selected applicants who clearly articulated their con the connections to sub superfund affected communities, as well as a high degree of involvement and leadership by those communities in their projects and programs. And ultimately, really had clear descriptions as well of what those outcomes and impacts of their efforts would be. 90% of this year's awards are led by and for BIPOC organizations or involve deep partnerships with benefits that are clear to BIPOC communities. And we're also very excited to have increased participation of native community groups within our um, cohort this year, which is one of the goals of our cycle. Next slide. So you're going to hear from just a moment in, uh, from a couple of the, the grantees directly, um, but I did want to provide just a couple of highlights for you all this morning um, to share a little bit about the, the type of work that's going to be done and to provide a little bit of that, that um, specificity. So um, we have organizations who are going to be also in Blueprint who are going to be teaching STEM using an environmental justice lens and using Portland Harbor Superfund as the way to, to do that, really focusing on BIPOC youth. Portland Harbor Community Coalition is going to be elevating community voices um, as the cleanup process moves forward. Uh, Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group and Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership are going to be working to build awareness and understanding of the Superfund through doing, uh, doing uh, place-based tours like, that are land-based and also getting folks on the water. Um, and then we have Living Islands, who's going to be doing education and engagement with the Pacific Islander community to help increase awareness of the health risks, the long-term health risks of eating resident fish. Um, and then we also have um, two organizations, Nasika Willamut and Pacific Northwest Council of Water Protectors, who are going to be holding culturally specific events that really focus on indigenous life ways and how to foster connections of stewardship and uh, connection and healing between community, native communities and the river. And then finally, we have um, uh, Ecotrust Green Workforce Academy, who you'll hear from shortly, um, who's going to be working on diversifying workforce in reversing the workforce for environmental remediation career pathways. 
We will monitor progress of these of this work through mid-year check-ins. We will also be collecting final reports that will document what outcomes have occurred, as well as the impacts and learnings. And we look forward to sharing those impacts and learnings and outcomes uh, with council as well as with the public next year. Um, I want to pause before we bring up our guest speakers to see if, if there are any questions for staff. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to pass the mic to um, three of our wonderful grantees. Um, first speaking will be Jason Stroman, who is the program director for Blueprint Foundation. Um, Erica Harrison, who is the Wayfinder camp administrator for ELSO. And Teresa Gaddy, who's the program manager uh, with EcoTrust Green Workforce Academy. So we'll pass it over to them. Excellent. And if you could hit the next thank slide, you. that would be wonderful too, thank you. Welcome, thanks for being here. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, like she mentioned, my name is Jason Stroman. I'm the program director for the Blueprint Foundation. Uh, our mission is to provide access where it otherwise might not exist, uh, including the chance to connect with nature and contribute to environmental justice through civic engagement and jobs in the green sector. We stress for us biased solutions to environmental degradation and socioeconomic stagnation that black people face due to historic, historically racist systems and ideology. The Portland Harbor program has provided us access to funds and technical expertise to open doors for black youth and young adults. Specifically, we've been able to get folks out on the water to teach about the science of the Superfund site cleanup and the jobs that our community can pursue related to increasing the safe use of the river for folks in the community. Uh, in addition to continuing our collaborations with uh, fellow grantees, uh, in this round of funding, we will go beyond water quality to address air quality. We will collect baseline and longitudinal air quality data that black community members can use to assess the safety of nature excursions. This data will also be helpful to decision makers and contractor, contractors tasked with reducing emissions along the site. They can use the baseline and longitudinal data we collect to measure the effectiveness of emission reduction efforts along the Superfund site. Best of all, black youth are doing the work to build and install sensors, collect and visualize data, and disseminate findings. So thank you for helping us to situate and build up young black scientists as stewards and subject, matters, subject matter experts in this area and remaining central to efforts to address these environmental impacts that disproportionately impact their community. Good morning, my name is Erica Harrison and I am the Associate Director of the Tap and Roots Program, um, Black Nature Educators Program of um, ELSO, Experience Life Science Outdoors, um, or, from, or known as ELSO Inc. or Camp ELSO. ELSO's vision is to cultivate generations of black and brown problem solvers and innovators for community and global impact. Since 2015, we have been serving black and brown communities across Portland, providing culturally relevant science and environmental education. I am excited to be here today to share with you about our work to connect with youth to vital environment and climate education, specifically around Portland Superfund site. The Wayfinders program will visit the area on Water Wednesdays and in age appropriate groups, meaning K through second, third and fourth, fifth and sixth, and seventh and eighth graders. Once at Cathedral Park, we will join up with community partners such as Laura Columbia Estuary Partnership and BEST staff to paddle while learning about the Superfront site, history, cleanup efforts, and various local wildlife and plants that are threatened by contaminants. Last year, we even stood atop a counter cap and learned how to sample and monitor the water. In the spring, we will visit Cathedral Park with eight to 10 camp guides to orient them to the site where they will lead and engage 80 K through eight youth in the summer months. We will engage in deeper conversations about culturally re relevant teaching and learning as well as which communities are most negatively impacted by river health and the impacts this has on economic and environmental justice. We are very proud and excited to collaborate with another community partner, the Blueprint Foundation, working with, sorry, Jason and the Blueprint Foundation for the, for the 
past few years as a key partner for the Tap and Roots program has been an amazing experience. 16 Tap and Roots Black Nature Educators High School Youth participated in symposiums focused on the Portland Harbor Fund Superfund site. Interns learned about the history of the site, cleanup efforts, industrial offenders, and environmental justice implications. The group will explore different ways to stay involved in the process, both now and in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Teresa Gaddy. I work at EcoTrust. Um, but more importantly for this program, my collaborative, the Green Workforce Academy, um, is really a collaboration between multiple partners, which include Blueprint. You'll notice a lot of us work together, and there's a lot of overlap, which is great, and I think critical to the success of our programs. Um, it also includes the Native American Youth Center, Self Enhancement Inc., and Wisdom of the Elders. Through this program, which is a five week long um, workforce readiness training program uh, created by and for black and native adults in the Portland area to get them into great jobs. Um, that was based on some information that we, uh, some studies we had done early on, um, and this program has been in place since late 2018 and been working with the City of Portland Bureau of Environmental Services since 2020. You know, started during the pandemic, did some virtual things, but now we get the, the benefit of going out on the river to similar spaces that my um, colleagues here mentioned to get our participants out there and exposed to all the information that Jessica and others uh, with BES provide. Um, and some of the benefits that we've seen are not just that they get this information for themselves and maybe help lead them to a green career, which is the, the um, sorry the eventual outcome that we're hoping for is to diversify the green sector um, and give black and native folks a chance to build intergenerational wealth and do work that they can be proud of um, that benefits their communities. Um, but we are also creating informed citizens. Uh, you know, through this, they're not just learning what taking all the stuff that we're teaching and um, all the wonderful experiences that we get to be part of, but they get to take that back to their homes, their families, their communities, and, and we see that as a really vital connection, and especially work like uh, what the city of Portland is doing here. Um, one of the benefits that we've seen already is that uh, one of the contractors, I know a lot of the work will be done through contractors in terms of cleanup, water quality monitoring, testing, um, and one of the contractors already reached out in 2021 to get some of our graduates to participate in an internship. And it took a lot of persuading, um, but I had one who was really interested in doing water work, but he had a little bit of a fear of the water. And after a lot of conversation, um, he decided, yeah, this was worth it to go and try something new and got out there on the water. A lot of it was on a boat, and so he was very unsure about being on the boat in the water. Um, but he got out there, had a great time, and when I checked in with him last year, he said it was a really great experience and he was so thankful that he did it and went through with it. And so I'm really hopeful that this will create a lot more opportunities like that going forward because I think that's what this really promises is more opportunities to get involved in this work locally um, through this exposure and this education that BES and programs like Green Workforce and others are providing to um, black and brown people in Portland. And Thank I think you. that's all we have for you today. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great for your presentation. Time. Very good. Colleagues, any further comments? Um, Mr. Mayor, I just want to um, I just want to number one congratulate uh, this year's awardees, and I also want to uh, thank uh, BES for the important work they do in the super fun space. Likewise, these are great programs. I really appreciate you coming in and sharing not only with us, but anybody else who's watching. Thank you for your leadership. And I look forward to hearing the results of these programs, but it, it sounds really good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to the regular agenda. The first item on the regular agenda is item 305. This is a second reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Amend system development charge financing and exemptions code to add new deferral option for the payment of system development charges. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, colleagues, today we will be voting on the option to defer system development charges for up to 24 months. Um, and I want to start by appreciating the conversations that council engaged in at the, first, at the time of the first reading where we heard testimony on this item that SDC payment deferral options um, 
may not, or the ones that were before us may not work for all housing projects, but um, however, it does work for many uh, new single family homes in the affordable price ranges. Uh, we know this proposal is a very beneficial tool for many development um, projects and we're very eager to proceed with moving the current proposal to approval and implementation while we and what at, at the same time we have staff continuing to work on the issues raised to explore possible alternative solutions that could be brought forward as a separate deferral option uh, for housing projects. BDS staff are already talking to lenders as well as the Revenue Bureau which collects SDCs and with the relevant staff in the four SDC bureaus to, to better understand the implications um, of all the options. Um, I would also like uh, to highlight that Portland currently has an SDC deferral program which charges interest but allows for a shorter maximum deferral period and which uses a lean in first <coughs> position. And on average about five projects per month use this deferral program. So by moving this ordinance today, we're demonstrating our commitment to making housing projects more financially feasible and getting more affordable housing development into the pipeline, which is why the city of Eugene is watching this ordinance closely today as they consider replication over there. So Director Esau, Kurt Kruger, and Rich Eisenhower are here and can provide more information and answer questions. Um, but, but before that, I would like to make a motion to amend item 305 to add an emergency clause to this item because it's necessary to make this available um, as soon, this tool available as soon as possible in order to support getting more housing production online. Second. There's a motion <coughs> to add an emergency clause seconded by Commissioner Ryan. There any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, call the roll on the amendment. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. It's now an emergency ordinance. Thank you, colleagues. Um, this is an important step in our 90-day action plan that will hopefully make projects uh, more financially feasible and ultimately strengthen our housing development pipeline. So now I'll turn it over to staff to recap the ordinance and answer any questions. And this, this is a second reading, so I'd encourage brevity. And if anyone has, any colleagues have questions. Thanks. So unfortunately, Kurt can't join us today. He got called in another meeting. Um, but I think, Commissioner Rubio, you kind of summed up. I mean, we've been having lots of conversations. I mean, this is a very complex issue and a lot of different trade-offs on both the private side and the public side. So we're, we're engaged to continue those conversations to find different options that can work for everybody. Great. Commissioner Maps has a question. Uh, yes. Um, if I understood Commissioner Rubio's comments uh, correctly, staff is talking to stakeholders about bringing potential um, amendments that would make e this uh, tool to build more housing even more effective. Do we have a sense of when those uh, proposed amendments or new ideas might come back to council? We're looking for a timeline of 60 to 90 days to be able to have okay. engagement with, with uh, Thank parties. you very much. And, and I assume some of those uh, potential changes will include engaging some of the folks who testified last week about the city's position, being first position on the lien. I, I assume those yes. conversations will continue as well? Yes, they will. Very good. I appreciate it. Commissioner Rubio, I appreciate the time and the energy you, uh, as well as the bureaus, have put into uh, the discussions with our team. And I, I realize this is being brought forward uh, by... Uh, three of our colleagues, is that correct? Yes. Yes, so we have Commissioner Rubio, Ryan, and Maps all working on this, and I want to uh, also just acknowledge the collaboration. Thank you for that. Great, any further questions or discussion? This is the second reading of what is now an emergency ordinance as amended. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, this is a good addition, additional option for many smaller scale developments and it's important that we take a look at all these tools to encourage more housing production. The reality is on any given project there are five to seven bureau reviews involved and with this many hands offs, many handoffs in the permit review process and we have to improve our permitting processes to facilitate more housing production. I'm looking at you, <laughs> Director Esau, we've been talking about this for ever since I got here. Uh, make, bonus, make no mistake, what is needed and recommended by the most recent audit is to streamline and improve our efficiency. Time is money for our customers, and I want to thank the members of the Permit Improvement Task Force, 
the permit improvement team led by Terry Tyson and all the bureaus that were working together and responding to customers with this shared sense of urgency. So I just wanted to make sure we lifted that as the big condition that will make this production possible. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I want to air my appreciation for staff and for the three colleagues who led this effort. I vote aye. Maps. Um, I'll echo Commissioner Gonzalez's uh, comments. I want to thank staff for their hard work under the, this innovative project, and I also want to express my appreciation for the partnership and collaboration. Uh, Commissioners Ryan and Rubio uh, um, demonstrated as uh, we try to develop uh, new tools that will bring more housing online here in Portland. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Um, again, I'll join my colleagues in thanking staff for all their great work on this and for um, looking at down every avenue and turning over every stone to make sure that um, we're, we're getting it right. So I really appreciate that attention to detail and all your hard work. Um, also, um, moving this ordinance forward, it's a significant step in our 90-day action plan, and I just want to remind people that it also includes recent code change for office to, to uh, residential conversions, uh, the regulatory reform survey, and also follow-up actions, and also um, as well as our work in identifying housing needs and costs and, and finding available land. So um, again, thanks to my colleagues, Commissioners Ryan um, and MAPS for all your work and collaboration on this and uh, for your continued support in improving the whole permitting system. So happy to vote aye. Wheeler. Well, a lot of the work that's been done on this is untangling years and years and years of varying layers uh, and even weaving of coats. And the bottom line is what all of this work has led to is what I think is a very common sense proposal to add flexibility to the SDC payment methodology. And this ultimately is gonna help us get more housing more quickly. And I am very heartened uh, to hear Commissioner Rubio, what you said as well as what staff said about the importance of continuing to have dialogues and continuing to bring reforms as we're able to do so. But this is, this is something we can do right now that'll have an immediate impact. Uh, I want to again reiterate my thanks to Commissioners Ryan, Rubio, and Maps for working very collaboratively on this. I appreciate it greatly. Uh, I vote aye, and the item is adopted as amended. Thank you. Thank you. And then the next item, please, on the regular agenda, this is item number 306, also a second reading. Amend Portland City Elections Code to implement ranked choice voting approved by voters in Portland Measure 26-288. Is there any further discussion on this particular item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. 306. Okay. Three, uh, yes, 306. All right. Hey, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Madam Auditor out there somewhere for bringing this forward. I recognize this is a technical amendment and I also want to put on the record my encouragement for the county to identify a politically agnostic group to provide education to Portlanders for ranked choice voting. I also understand there is a RFP process out for that contract. However, I will not approve the contract if it is not a politically agnostic group. I am ready to vote aye today. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Um, I want to thank Mayor Wheeler and Madam Auditor Reddy um, and their teams. I really appreciate all the time and effort that were put into these changes. Um, I believe you brought us a thoroughly vetted proposal that represents community voice, um, and I'm really happy to support this ordinance. I vote aye. Wheeler. I want to thank City Auditor Simone Reddy for her partnership in bringing this item to council. I'd also like to thank the various members of the auditor's staff, as well as the charter transition team for their hard work and uh, what I thought was really a great presentation and discussion last week. And in particular, I'd like to thank Lisa Howley, Becky Limboli, Shoshana Oppenheim, Barry Pack, and of course there were many, many others. These code changes will allow us to appropriately implement the voter approved charter changes that were passed overwhelmingly last November and better ensure uh, that both we and our county partners will be ready for the 2024 election cycle. So thanks everybody for uh, putting in uh, some really terrific work here. I vote aye and the ordinance is adopted. Thank you. 
Colleagues, we've had a request for a break. Uh, why don't we take a 10-minute recess? We will reconvene at 11.25. We're in recess.
in session. Item number 307, a second reading, please. Adopt the FY 2022-23 spring supplemental budget and make other budget-related changes. Colleagues, this is the second reading of the spring 2023 budget monitoring process package, also familiarly known as the spring bump. Last week, the city budget office and its director, Tim Grew, walked us through the spring supplemental budget ordinance as it was originally proposed. Then council introduced and voted on amendments and we heard public testimony. Due to a lack of consensus, we voted to remove the emergency clause and the ordinance passed on today to its second reading. However, I understand that some of my colleagues, myself included, may have additional amendments for consideration before we vote on this item. With that, I'm gonna open the floor in here and second amendments, and I'd like to kick us off with an amendment of my own. I'm proposing, colleagues, the following amendment to be listed as Wheeler 1. A motion to amend the spring bump ordinance to add a finding and a directive for continued services in the impact reduction program. The following finding will be amended into the spring bump ordinance. The fall bump and spring bump in fiscal year 2022-23 have included additional funds to ensure that the impact reduction program is able to maintain service levels throughout the remainder of this fiscal year. The current contract does not match the current run rate for the city-owned and Oregon Department of Transportation-owned cleanups and the contract will require additional funds in order to match the revised budget. The following directive will be added to the spring bump ordinance. The chief procurement officer designee is authorized to amend contract number 31002015 to increase the total contract value by an additional $12 million for a new contract not to exceed a total of $38,603,000 provided the amendment has been approved as to form by the city attorney's office. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Is there any further discussion or amendments before we hear public testimony? I Commissioner haven't. Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, colleagues, what happened last week shouldn't sit well with any of us. Part of good governance is leading with curiosity, asking questions, and engaging with one another before we walk into these chambers. And that didn't happen last week and harm was done. And the city again stood in the way of the work to get these dollars programmed and out the door as committed to the community. But good governance, all, governance also means taking a pause and reflecting. We're all human and elected officials and we should take the ability to change direction and recommit with shared understanding to the expectations we all hold for the use of public funds and the path forward and rectifying harms in order to restore trust in our commitments. And given all that's happened, it bears repeating. Over the past two years, this work hasn't moved forward as quickly as we'd all originally hoped. And part of that responsibility is on us. The city hasn't shown up in a consistent way to support reimagine and moving the work forward. And as an example, Nearly every city staffer involved in the original conversations in 2020, including all three bureau directors tasked with standing up this work, have left the city. Fast forward to this past January, when Commissioner Ryan and I, with the support of council, agreed that the cannabis fund would be transferring to Prosper, we got to work with Reimagine so that we were ready to pick up the work once the funds were transferred on July 1. Colleagues, to get this back on track, I put on the table the following amendment in collaboration with Commissioner Ryan. A motion to repeal amendment maps amendment number two, which would adjust the supplemental budget to ensure transfer of carryover funds in the recreational cannabis tax fund for Reimagine Oregon for $4,800,087,388 and guarantee the transference of recreational cannabis funds and its administration from Civic Life to Prosper Portland by July 1, 2023. Second. Commissioner Rubio moves Rubio one. Commissioner Ryan seconds. And 
in addition to following the passage of this amendment today, we will start work again on our original plan as instructed by the 90-day resolution, which already included reporting out to council offices around May 10th. So Prosper will be ready by that date. And I finally, I ask that we keep the May 30 work session on the calendar to ensure that this council has a collective and transparent dis discussion about the cannabis fund and more generally so that there is a shared understanding among all of us from here on out. So back to you, Mayor. Thank you. I do I understand that you have a second amendment? I, I do. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, thank yeah. you. So colleagues, I want to begin my remarks today by acknowledging the session last week as well. And thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for what you had to say. My vote on Commissioner Mapp's amendment was the hardest vote I've had to make on this dais. While I did not agree with much of the tone and some of the dialogue, I do think Commissioner Mapp's amendment created a sense of urgency and begged the question, what more could we all have done to ensure that these investments were put to their best use for the past three years? I cannot be silent and allow the funding intended for black Portlanders to remain untapped and to roll over into another budget year. My vote in support of the amendment was not about was about not repeating the same mistakes and acknowledging something is not right. Simply put, I could not remain silent since nothing has moved. Since last week's vote on this amendment, my team did a deep dive to research the issue. In doing so, it became more and more clear that balls were dropped on all sides with the city tipping the scales. We need to accept this responsibility and reset this work. As an elected official, who was not here when the set aside for Reimagine Oregon was created, I fully respect the intent of the work and I am responsible to manage the people's money to deliver the results on that intent. In partnership with Commissioner Rubio and with the support of the Office of Management and Finance, the Office of Civic Life and Prosper Portland, we are committed to create a path forward for accountable action and expedite community impact. We have a commitment from Prosper to provide this council a 45-day report out with a holistic plan for funding to reimagine Oregon. Ironically, I was chairing the Portland Children's Levy Allocation Committee meeting yesterday. The levy was a clean, has a clean, transparent, outcome-driven system. The community organization writes a proposal, they are all rewarded, and annually, the work is reviewed. In a few cases, adjustments are made to cut the investment due to not delivering on the original goal. My point is, we need such accountable systems for all of our investments. I appreciate the conversations I've had with my colleagues this week. I, I sit on a council that remains focused on getting this right. I also appreciate the many, and there were many, messages I received from community. Some were extremely helpful, and some were actually disappointing, as they wanted to blame one side and reveal little empathy for the complexity of this issue. We need all sides to come to the table hungry to deliver results for the community. Can we focus on the work, please? Idealism without action for many years got Portland to its deepest ditch in our history. The news of REI departing, the recent stabbings, the hard drug crisis poisoning and killing individuals what seems like daily is also killing the soul of many Portlanders. We cannot continue to tolerate the intolerable and it's time for us to work together in good faith for the people we are serving. It's time to deliver pragmatic practices to save our city. In another step towards pragmatic action, I would like to present the following amendments alongside my colleague, Commissioner Carmen Rubio, to reaffirm the city's commitment to investing in the black community in Portland and building stronger relationships with the city. Ryan Rubio, Amendment 2 motion to make the following adjustments to the supplemental budget as amended to appropriate a fund transfer of cannabis fund resource from the Office of Community and Civic Life to Prosper Portland and D appropriate the remaining budget for carryover in fiscal year 2023 and 2024. Second. Commissioner, oh, wait, I have to read. Oh, okay. I don't want to, but I have to read all these details. Oh, okay, <laughs> go for it. It's part of the, yeah. Hold on. Decrease Budget Bureau expense in the Office of Community and Civic Life by $825,000 in Fund 227060, Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund, Civic Life by 825000 
increase fund transfer expense in the Bureau of Community and Civic Life by 825,000 in fund 227060 Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund, Civic Life to transfer that cannabis fund resources to Prosper Portland business area. Tim, I'm glad you're nodding. Um, increase Bureau program expenses in Prosper Portland by 825,000 in fund 227050 Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund, Prosper Portland to fund four seed grantees, iUrban Teen, Rosewood Initiative, Imagine Black, and REAP. Decrease Bureau program expenses in the Bureau of Community and Civic Life by $4,062,388 in fund 227060, Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund, Civic Life for program carryover allocation in fiscal year 23-24, Mayor's proposed budget. Decrease Bureau program expense in the Prosper Portland by 825,000 in fund 227050, Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund, Prosper Portland by 825,000 to carry over to fiscal year 2324. Update exhibits one through five as needed to reflect this change. Now I'm done. Uh, very good. So that's read into the record. Commissioner Rubio, you still second that, yes. I presume? Second. And okay. Commissioner Rubio um, would like for the record to read the full Rubio 1 amendment just so that we have it on the record in its totality. Go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. Motion to repeal MAPS Amendment 2, which will adjust the supplemental budget to ensure transfer of carryover funds in the Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund for Reimagine Oregon for $4,887,388 and guarantee the transference of recreational cannabis funds and its administration from Civic Life to Prosper Portland by July 1, 2023. Uh, decrease the Bureau program expense in the Bureau of Community and Civic Life by $4,888,388 and in fund 227060, Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund Civic Life for program carryover allocation in the fiscal year 23-24 Mayor's proposed budget. And update exhibits one through five as needed to reflect this change. I second. Yeah, it's already been seconded. She just wanted to get the full, full narrative on the record. Uh, okay, great. Any other amendments? Commissioner Maps. Um, when we're, if, if there's space to ask questions about some of these amendments, um, uh, I have some questions. Yeah, go for it. Um, first, uh, Mr. Mayor, you introduced an amendment around ERP. I have no problems with that. Makes sense. I'm going to be glad to support it. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, last night, sometime after 5 o'clock, there was um, council offices circulated um, some amendments around uh, the reimagine Oregon um, carry proposed carryovers, um, and by just in about a half an hour ago, uh, the amend which is the amendments that I've been trying to understand, um, and then about a half an hour ago, I was handed a piece of paper while I was up here on uh, on the dais, uh, and the amendments that we're asked to vote on today are, are a little bit different. So I'm still just trying to catch up on what is happening here. And some of this I think I support, and some of this I, I think I don't understand. Um, let me st ask uh, Commissioner Ryan, can you just give us an intuitive sense of what you're trying to do with, um, with your amendment? Yeah. Intuitively, it was that because last week was so rushed, there wasn't time to look at all the factors on the city side of the street. I'm a firm believer that you got to make sure your side of the street is clean before you move forward. And so I really appreciate my staff um, and a lot of the teams on the city council offices digging a little bit deeper. And once I got clear about that, it was important for me to work with Commissioner Rubio and all of you. That's why we had conversations yesterday about how we can make this right to move forward. Um, and I okay. think that we could have detailed dialogue if we want. I know we have people here from Prosper Portland who have been very active in this. I want to thank Shabri. I had the, we were just fortunately already signed up to meet with Prosper Portland last Thursday morning. It was very timely. And I think that meeting set this in motion for me. Sure. Um, 
I, I appreciate, I think I was asking a slightly different question. Uh, I appreciate all the factors that caused you. You a chance to be intuitive, and so I rifted with you. Oh, yeah. no, I, mm -hmm. I, I, you have great intuition. You're very good, good at being in the moment. Um, I, um, I appreciate all the complicated factors that caused you to um, re rethink where you're at on this. I'm just trying to understand what this ordinance does. How does policy change by virtue of this? And if you, if you want, we could probably yeah. rely to... Well, it, but go to budget. Yeah. Books. Well, it funds the four nonprofits. In addition to, to um, reimagine, I have to look at the list again so I don't screw it up. Hey, here, I, I, Tim. Do you want to help? Uh, I'll, I'll give it a start. We have our staff here sure. as well. This looks very complicated because we're going through a lot of different funds yeah, and yeah, accounts yeah. and that sort of thing. But th the goal here, or not the goal, what's actually happening is we're taking $825,000 from cannabis and sending $825,000 to Prosperous Portland for this work. And so, so we're taking dollar, we're taking these cannabis dollars uh, from Civic Life, putting it into Prosper, and then we're using it to fund uh, the seed grants that have basically already been on the table. Yes. All right. Um, Commissioner Ryan, um, I support that. You know, uh, I'm one of the reasons why I raise questions about um, how we spent cannabis dollars has been that, uh, frankly, for many years, some of these cannabis dollars, like 4.8 million of them, uh, have not gone out the door. So I, I, um, I certainly don't want to do anything that would uh, inhibit or slow down dollars getting out the door, especially when they appear to be prepared to... Um, uh, to actually get out in the community. Uh, so I appreciate the dialogue there. Now, C Commissioner Rubio, can you uh, provide us with an intuitive understanding of what you're trying to accomplish um, with your amendment? Yes, I'm um, repealing what was passed last week because there was a plan in place. So it, in effect, removes obstacles to the plan that we voted on as a council to stay in place. Um, okay, I, I'm just a little bit confused here, but so maybe you can help me understand this. Um, so you, uh, I see two pieces of this. One is to, let's just focus in on the carryover piece, I think. I really, I'm more than fine with the notion of basically shifting uh, the administration of cannabis dollars from Civic Life uh, to Prosper Portland. That strikes me as being wise and happy to support that. And I think I understand that and understand the reasons why uh, it, it might be more appropriate there. I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand um, the reimagine, what you're trying to do with the reimagine Oregon uh, carryover. Um, so you would basically repeal the amendment that I put forward um, last week, and then uh, the carryover would still go to the 4.8 million would still go to pro to Rebatchin, Oregon. Is that what you're trying to do? Yes, and exactly how it was before. Okay, so you're just it going would transfer as as discussed and as was the plan by July 1, 2023. So um, except for maybe Prosper administering these dollars, you're still just basically proposing essentially the bump carryover that uh, Civic Life uh, um, brought to the budget office? Right. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, sorry, um, Robert Cheney, budget office. So the, bu the budget, the spring bump as filed um, had a, Carryover requests yep. from Civic Life yep. that deappropriated that 4.8 million, yep. so that it would be available on July 1st, and that would be a part of the mayor's proposed budget, the approved, the adopted. Um, your amendment last week undid that deappropriation and would have let those funds fall to balance. Okay. Commissioner Rubio's amendment now deappropriates those again. Um, what's not captured in the amendment because the bump is a current year yep. um, a budgeting exercise is that that 4.8 million will be included uh, in, uh, you know, I don't want to speak presumptively, but it will be included in the mayor's proposed. Um, and in that case, it would probably be in the Prosper Portland budget, um, but we don't make appropriations to the July 1 budget in the bump. That's why uh, the, the Ruby amendment that was just introduced doesn't capture that, um, but that's, that's the intent. Okay, I, 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 think I, I think I understand that, and the pieces that are kind of vague here are not the pieces that I, uh, um, I think are uh, most confusing. 
Um, Commissioner Rubio, can you remind us what you, um, what services that do you expect these 4.8 million to provide? What the, what the community and Prosper come up with. So you haven't defined a, so just last week, I think we heard, I think four people testified in favor of this. I think everyone who testified indicated that they plan to spend those dollars uh, to support small back black businesses or small BIPOC businesses. Is it your understanding that that's what these dollars are gonna go for or do you expect this to be spent on something Commissioner, I different? think we talked about a report out on May 10 as planned and that's, that's when you, we will all learn. Um, let me go to back to the budget office. Uh, so I, I think the document that kind of describes what we're doing here is the spring bump submitted by the Office of Civic Life. Um, I think the request name there is 17557, goes the title is Reimagine Oregon backslash community-led budgeting. Um, is that the... Uh, Am I looking at the right piece of paper here? Am I basically understanding the mechanics of what we're trying to do? The, hold on. Bump amendment request report, spring, I think, you, I think they submitted it on 316.23. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you on that. Oh, sure. Um, so yeah, I'm looking at the, the spring bump, um, the spring bump request submitted by the Office of Civic Life for this 4.8, um, it allocates it to reimagine Oregon, and it says it's for community-led budgeting. I guess one of the things that's confused me in this space this whole time is what that community-led budgeting piece means, because I, I see it, these dollars being used for community-led budgeting. I think last week I heard these were gonna be used to help support small businesses, and I think I just heard that Commissioner Rubio say that sometime in May we will have a meeting and figure out what these dollars were, will be spent for. So do these dollars have a specific, how are these dollars being allocated? For what purpose? May I jump in here? Um, so, uh, we have been outlining that it, the presentation would be May 10th for some time, but I think to, to just give more clarity, I'm gonna ask if Shabri Vickers and Jillian Shoney, my staff can come forward just to provide any, um, answer your questions more directly, starting with Shabri. Sure, but before I, before I let the budget folks go, let me just be clear. So basically we're talking, since you, when you strip out my amendment, we're basically back down to uh, uh, moving forward with the spring bump that was submitted by Commissioner Ryan. Is that correct? For the, for the reimagined working carryover? Yeah, as of right now, your amendment and uh, that was passed and Rubio's amendment that is on the table yep. effectively cancel each other. Yep, yeah. so which means that really moving forward should uh, Commissioner Rubio's amendment pass, uh, we're essentially talking about the, the, the civic life's uh, carryover for Reimagine Oregon. Uh, let me jump in, yeah, sorry, sorry. I've, I've been biting my tongue. Um, what it does is it takes us back to where we were in January yeah. when the council by unanimous resolution authorized the transfer of those funds from Civic Life to Prosper Portland yep. with a process attached yep. to it. That's what we agreed to unanimously. And so collectively, this takes us back to it. Commissioner Ryan's amendment with reference to four specific organizations, that's already gone through a process. It's already been agreed to in the community. So that simply acknowledges that those funds have already been in play. Now, if we just play this out to its logical conclusion, we can move that to July 1st, or we can actually get those funds out the door ASAP, as soon as we can put an emergency okay. clause on this and be done with it. So that's already gone through the process, both at the city and in the community. It's already been agreed to, and those funds need to go out the door. And the only thing holding it up is us. The rest of it, takes us back to the unanimous resolution passed by council in January, which is what we should stick with. That's what we agreed to. That's what the community believes was the plan. 
Okay, Mr. Mayor, I, I know you're in a hurry and it's been a long day, so let me just cut to this chase. One of the things that really confuses me about uh, this entire space and that's confused me for years is in 2019-20, this council allocated uh, this about $2 million a year to reimagine Oregon out of the cannabis fund. The purpose of that allocation was for community-led budgeting, uh, which I find, which is, your community-led budgeting may be a good thing or a bad thing, but one of the things that community-led budgeting is not is one of the um, approved expenses for what you can spend cannabis dollars on. It's my understanding that uh, this cannabis fund is restricted and those dollars must be spent on drug and alcohol treatment, public safety, or to support for small businesses. Um, and for the past three years, we've been moving along this paperwork that we're, says we're gonna spend these dollars on community-led budgeting, but it strikes me that that is an illegal expenditure and we have yet to really come to terms with that. Uh, and one of the reasons why I'm kind of dying on this hill is I try not to sign off on things that I think are illegal, and this kind of strikes me as not being consistent with the letter or spirit of the law. Now, if we want to make a, a, a motion here to say, uh, to change the title of this bump and say we'll spend it on small business or whatnot, I think we kind of clean up that, that sort of lingering problem. Uh, but so far, every time I try to get this pinned down, the purpose of these funds and when we are going to expend them <laughs> changes or the date shifts. Um, Mr. Budget Director, can you help me out? Am I confused? Are you able to go through this? We've um, got the details here. Yeah. Okay, Ruth Levine with the City Budget Office. So um, I think um, there is some confusion. You're not wrong. The title of the carryover package has reimagined Oregon slash community led budgeting. Yeah. Um, I think that is a legacy of the way the funds were allocated, which was actually done in, in several um, chunks. And so I can, I can, rather than try to run down verbally exactly what was allocated when, we're happy to provide a table afterwards to council that breaks down what was allocated when. What I can say is as of right now, the amount that's in the spring bump is that 4.8 million, 4887388, um, that is still for Reimagine Oregon. There is additionally, a million dollars of seed funds that was carried over in the bump as filed, and then Commissioner Ryan's amendment today adds 825,000 additionally on top of that to transfer that to Prosper Portland and carry it over. Um, and um, and then you know the as Robert was saying earlier, the the actual transfers will happen in the in the proposed budget in the 23-24 fiscal year budget. The, I think your question about community-led budgeting, um, I think what happened there is that it actually got, um, it's actually general fund, it's not cannabis fund. There was 1.5 million, um, and I can get the details on when that was allocated, um, that is actually now sitting in the special appropriations budget, um, and that amount is encumbered, meaning it's already in, um, there's already a grant contract for that. So we can follow up on the details on that, but I think that, that it's, I, I think there's probably some confusion around the title of the carryover package. Are you saying I don't understand it or it's mixed labeled? And it, I, I think, can be, I I think can, it's confusingly labeled. <laughs> Mr. Budget Director, can you help me here? I think this is what we came to agreement on, right? It, I think that the title is causing a lot of confusion. Yeah. Because it's been there for a while. Yeah. But things are being reallocated here. So I think as it stands here, the goal of getting to four, what is it, four seven, four eight eight seven, back to where we were previously, so it can be reallocated in the mayor's proposed budget. And that'll be done in a way that's clear in terms of where the funds are gonna be, what funds are gonna be allocated, mm -hmm. and the process for determining how whatever remaining balances, um, remaining balances is in the proposed budget will be a process to allocate those. Well, at what point do we launder, when does the language, because this, 
This language around community-led budgeting has been go has been th in our budgets for three for like three years. Um, at what point do we launder this ordinance enough so that goes away? Uh, um, because I, I certainly look at that title, and I, my interpretation of that title is that is what council approved these dollars to be spent on. And frankly, I think if you go back and take a look at the record at that time, I kind of think that that council intended to spend this money on community-led budgeting, which, in my, in my understanding of the, of the law, is kind of not an allowed expense, and we've kind of let it roll forward for three or four years, whatever it's been. Um, so I kind of want to, my goal here, um, number one is to get the dollars out the door, and number two is to um, try to protect the city from continuing to do, to carry, I want to get out of, of, of sending out, signing paper that seems to be inconsistent with the law. Yeah, I think that the 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 title is not in the ordinance itself. Um, it's it's sort of background document to the ordinance. So I think we can certainly clear up the the use of those funds. Um, but I I don't think it impacts the bump ordinance as amended. May I just ask? I just it's it's really important to me. Is anything about this illegal? Can we can we just clarify that it's not? No, there's no no. There's Thank you. I just I just I, it's it I just you know I just want to make I, I that think the clear. Easy I, it's solution. just unusual that we ask if something's illegal as a policy that we've vetted and thought of and has come to the budget office. Um, I understand and your concern. I just, you know, I, I would I just second that the yeah. part of the role of the budget office is to make sure that we do comport with state yeah. budget laws as well as our own local ordinances. That's <coughs> what they do. And um, Mr. Mayor, I think in your proposed budget process, we can create clarity of getting this title correctly in the decision package that will be approved in the proposed budget. Yeah, good. All right. Anything else? Uh, are you done, Commissioner Maps? Yeah, thank you for Great. the dialogue. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, my questions are with initially are with respect to IRP. Can we just get high level what's driving this increased amount? I want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. So that we're we're increasing the not to exceed the 38 million six. That's an increase of 12 million. Can we just some visibility on understanding? what's driving this, what we're doing to cost engineer here. Um, it's, it's a big number and so just trying to get my arms around it. Tim, you wanna take that? You can add that. Uh, yeah, so uh, the is mirrors- Is your mic on? Is it green? Hello? Is Keelan, is it going through? Uh, okay. Yes, okay, great, thank you. Um, sorry, Commissioner Gonzalez, your question is regarding uh, Mayor Wheeler's amendment. Uh, basically, it just increases the total for the contract. It's my understanding that the program was not doing work, uh, was not doing ODOT funded work. So, so uh, th this is basically the allocation, and, and Michael will jump up and, and shout objection if I'm wrong. This is the additional dollars coming in through ODOT. Is that through the state that the governor has now committed to ODOT? Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. That and um, there was an additional increase of general fund resources to the impact reduction program in the bump is filed as well. Thank you. And, and just the, the quick history there, not, not to belabor this, um, the funding that was originally allocated to IRP for the ODOT intergovernmental agreement was a number that was effectively a guesstimate. We worked in close collaboration with ODOT through Region 1 to scale the cleanups that were required. Those cleanups were burning at a faster rate than the funds that had been allocated both the state and the city knew that, we understood that, and we knew that we were going to collectively ask for additional resources 
to get us through the end of the fiscal year. In addition, we agreed that we would ask for the correct budget based on actual experience for the next biennium, which we've done. We've put that request before the legislature. Yeah, and to be clear, this amendment does not change appropriations at all. It just Thank amends you. the contract. Correct. So this is strictly a not to exceeds. This is just putting like, that that's it. That's all we're doing here. Yes. Yeah. Raising the cap. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I just would note it's a big number and it's been growing. I get the ODAP piece, but it's, it's a large chunk of change. I just want to circle back to um, Commissioner Maps' questions on the Rubio Amendment. I want to clarify one piece and then just follow, ask a follow-up question. I don't think, bottom line, I, certainly speaking for myself, I don't think there's any concern in moving dollars or moving this from civic to life to prosper Portland as we approved in January. Um, it was in reviewing the program that we, you know, many of us had questions, uh, particularly with the reimagine Oregon piece. Um, those questions really, for my take, weren't really actually answered last week. Um, but I, just so I am crystal clear, there is an element of this that is related to participatory budgeting or community-led budgeting. And that's coming from the general funds. Is that is that right? That's the one five. Yeah. Yes. Do so we have one five? There's one point five million in the general fund, special appropriation. And, and the component that is related to the cannabis fund, it, it is strictly for small business, or how is it teed up currently? Yeah, um, Sh Shabri so can come up and, and answer that very quickly and directly. Yeah. And Shabri, can you Thank state you. your name for the record? We all know you, but <laughs> certainly. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Shabri Vickers, um, and yes, um, in <clears throat> excuse me, uh, City Code six zero seven one four five, the funds can be allocated in three ways. In particular, for Prosper Portland, the support for neighborhood small businesses, especially women-owned and minority-owned businesses, including but not limited to business incubator programs, management training, and job training opportunities, and providing economic opportunity and education to communities disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. So the the funds, I think that you're talking about, that's how. Uh, they would be spent in those spaces. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, I think you asked about small businesses. That's exactly where those funds would be spent. And, and if I were to look up, thank you for that, that in, and you're referencing the part of the code that, uh, that I was thinking about. So if I were, or a voter or a taxpayer were to go look at the reimagined Oregon uh, program plan right now, where would they find that that portion of the dollars is going to go to small business. And we certainly heard that in concept last week. I'm just trying to tie this out, that what was previously approved for those portion of the dollars is going to small business. So uh, we will be, as, as Commissioner Rubio mentioned, we'll come back in 45 days um, and May 30th also for a work session if that is if that helps uh, answer all the questions about specifically where small business dollars would go um, and the, the split behind what that might look like. But the intent uh, is around economic opportunity and um, small business specifically, especially those uh, women-owned and uh, minority-owned businesses. So as you note in there, it's also limited to business incubator programs, uh, management training and job uh, training opportunities. So those specific to, I think, our economy here in Portland, which is a small business economy. So we look forward to supporting uh, those efforts through community insight around how we can best support the black community and, and small businesses there. And, and just to be crystal clear, I, and that's super helpful in terms of, of the go for getting alignment with cannabis dollar, you know, uh, requirements. But in looking back, just trying to understand if in reviewing what has been approved, because I'm the new guy here, I wasn't here in any of the twists and turns, just trying to get my handle around where we are at the moment. In looking back at what City Council previously approved with respect to this, where can they tie out, you know, where could I tie out that this was originally designed for uh, small business, not not the language of the uh, cannabis code, I'm familiar with that, but where the this council previously approved it for small business use. 
So from my understanding, uh, council has uh, agreed to work with Reimagine Oregon and Reimagine Oregon specifically stated that economic opportunity was an issue that they recognized to be um, uh, uh, prime concern uh, back in 2020 and when this all came forward. So the, the request from community, I think from uh, uh, Reimagine Oregon Director Justice Raji has consistently been around economic opportunity and economic investment specific to the black community. Um, so that has remained consistent in all of what Justice has brought forward in the conversations that we've had with community. That's exactly um, where all conversations, especially since last week, have been uh, connected to. So, um, and as, Prosper, as we mentioned last week, uh, Prosper Portland is your economic development agency, so that's what we uh, specifically do, and, and that's how we would be working with Reimagine Oregon in particular. Um, I, you know, if you think about some of the work that we did uh, recently over the, the, the last uh, few years here, we're confident we can get the, the funds out to community and businesses moving forward right alongside Reimagine Oregon. Prosper Portland has consistently demonstrated our capacity to do this work in, in partnership with the city council in the past. I mean, I think if you remember back um, while you weren't sitting here at the council, through April and October of 2020, Prosper Portland provided over $13 million in relief funds to more than 1,200 businesses, including initial relief funds that went to the Jade District and Old Town, uh, Chinatown businesses through our partnerships with Apano uh, and our first iteration of the Small Business Relief Fund grants. So we look forward to using many of the infrastructure that we established over the past few years to ensure that we get dollars out in this regard in partnership with Reimagine Oregon. Um, and just so that you know, most of those resources that I just mentioned went to people of color and women with approximately 88% invested in BIPOC business owners. 452 uh, were BIPOC women-owned businesses receiving grants totaling more than $5 million. Um, and a quarter of the grants went to East Portland businesses and 24% of those went to businesses in North and Northeast Portland. So we have a record and, and have demonstrated our um, capacity to work with community to ensure that their goals um, are present in how we disperse funds and grants, specifically partnered with small businesses here in Portland. Okay. Um, and maybe that question, uh, that's helpful background. I appreciate what you've done for the, the diversity of communities in the city of Portland with respect to economic development. Um, I'm still unclear as to whether that addresses what prior city council approved with respect to these dollars, but I'll circle back to that uh, shortly. Um, but I do want to be crystal clear on go for Prosper Portland is responsible for this, you know, overseeing the cannabis uh, fund. And that includes things beyond economic development, right? There's, it's including dollars for medical, uh, uh, for example, firefighters, medical uh, substance use uh, treatment, all of the items listed in in the code, correct? Or is that will that be outside of Prosper's purview? Do you want to? No, the, yeah. the city will still be managing the cannabis fund. What we will be doing is transferring from the cannabis fund to Prosper in order to implement programs, which I believe will come back to you in 45 days correct. for your review and approval. And those programs will include non-economic development programs potentially that are permitted uses of the cannabis funds? They would have to be uses that are consistent with the purpose of the cannabis fund. Got it. So, and then just to be crystal clear, so Prosper Portland will be overseeing distribution of dollars related to the cannabis fund that have nothing to do with economic development that as long as they're specified somewhere else in the cannabis code. Right, because the funding is coming from the cannabis fund. Got it. Okay. And, and there's many, many other projects being funded in the cannabis fund. And uh, that's why it oh. remains in the city, city, city council's prerogative. Totally, totally fall. And I, and I just want to be crystal clear. I feel like Commissioner Maps has asked this a couple of times. I feel like I've asked it a couple of times and I'm still not walking away feeling like the answer has been completely answered. I understand about the participatory budgeting piece and the confusion of the heading. I totally follow. I think your answers to that were clarifying. I am still unclear as to what city council has previously approved with respect to economic development for these specific dollars, what was approved in 2020, 2021, 2022. I, I, and so it, it would be helpful to be able to, to connect that dot to the specific code language 
what was the specific proposal before city council with respect that aligned with the cannabis fund, cannabis fund requirements? We commit to bringing a more comprehensive update to council in the 45 days and on May 30th, if, if we're still going to use that work session as well, to bring more detailed plans, especially as it relates to the Prosper Portland uh, portion of the, the funds. And the grants office and CBO can do a separate analysis to make sure that's in compliance with the cannabis, cannabis funds. Jillian, did you want to get in on this? I, I can't. Uh, or did you want to say something? Yes, I just want to reiterate what Commissioner Rubio said and what Shabri just can, said. Can you say okay. it into the microphone for the record? Sorry. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Robert. Sorry. For the record, Jillian Choney, Chief of Staff to Commissioner Carmen Rubio. I just, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, Commissioner Maps, um, as Commissioner Rubio said, and the mayor, Prosper um, was directed by this council unanimously back in February to prepare to receive this fund. They have been doing that work. They have been engaging with Reimagine Oregon. Today, we are undoing the action from last week so that that work can continue. Shabri and team will be ready to report out on the Prosper Portland piece of this on May 10th as originally scheduled prior to last week. And then it is our suggestion and very much desire that the May 30th work session stays on as scheduled so we can have gain a very, um, a complete understanding of the cannabis fund and all of its uses above and beyond Reimagine Oregon. So all of these questions will be answered and we will have all the data and the history and the information from CBO on May 30th. I appreciate the comment, Jillian. I just wanna be clear, we have asked repeatedly for historic context on how, what was specifically asked of city council with respect to these dollars and the use of cannabis funds. And to date, we have still not gotten that answer. I appreciate the clarification we just received with respect to participatory budgeting. I think that is clarifying, um, but that answer still doesn't address just trying to get us up to speed. What is the history here? How was it previously approved? And again, we can go do the homework. I just was hoping that we could, you know, have gotten that clarified by this point in time. Commissioner, um, is the issue that you want to know when this money was a initially allocated what it was going to be used for in terms of purposes exactly we can and go back we, go the we can go back through the record and find that information and make sure you have it in terms of what details are there and Commissioner Gonzalez, I can also just share with you at Prosper Portland, we do engage in robust measurement, monitoring, and evaluation of our programs, and that would continue, of course, with our partnership with Reimagine Oregon and our many tools. Uh, we used to do that first and foremost with, we have direct accountability to you all here at council. You continue to serve as our oversight budget committee in this space and would help us analyze impact and support to Portlanders. And we look forward to the continued and ongoing partnership alongside Reimagine Oregon in this regard, uh, moving past just the, the um, upcoming uh, fiscal year and you know lastly we utilize robust grant contract uh, mo uh, monitoring tools to assess efficacy of our programs um, we do this through yearly outcomes checklist to each business owner with our service providers and programs like IBRN which you all have heard about in the past um, excuse me that's our inclusive business resource network along with annual surveys to program participants and small businesses supported. And finally, we utilize quarterly compliance reporting, which helps us assess for long-term outcomes and robust data tracking and software made available to service providers. So we will continue to use our infrastructure that we have today to ensure that um, Portlanders, especially Reimagine Oregon and the community that are concerned with what we are um, able to partner with them now can do moving forward. Thank you. Great. I'm done uh, for now. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, and now an encore performance by Commissioner Ryan. Oh. I have to reread the amendment because one of the codes was wrong, but I don't know which one, so just read the whole thing. Sorry, everyone. Here we go. Motion, Ryan 2, motion to make the following adjustments to the supplemental budget as amended to, to appropriate a fund transfer of cannabis fund resources from the Office of Community and Civic Life to Prosper Portland and then deappropriate the balance for carryover in fiscal year 2023. Decrease bureau program expense in the Office of Community and Civic Life by 825,000 and fund 227060 Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund Civic Life by 825,000. 
to increase fund transfer expense in the Bureau of Community and Civic Life by 825,000 in fund 227060, Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund Civic Life, to transfer that cannabis fund resources to Prosper Portland business area. Three, bullet, bullet three, increase Bureau program expense in Prosper Portland by 825,000 in fund 227050, Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund Prosper Portland to fund four seed grantees, iUrban Teen, Rosewood Initiative, Imagine Black, and REAP. Bullet four, in decrease Bureau program expense in the Prosper Portland by 825,000 in fund 227050, Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund, Prosper Portland, to carry over to fiscal year 23-24. Fifth bullet update exhibits 1-5 as needed to reflect this change. Did I do it right this time, Keelan? All right, cool. All right, good, thank you. And uh, no further action is required on that. Uh, it's a uh, um, Scribner error. Yeah. So we'll just simply replace that language for the former. All right, uh, public testimony. Uh, well, first of all, any other questions? Public testimony on the amendments, specific to the amendments. We have two people signed up. First Very good. up, uh, Justice Reggie. Thank you. Three minutes each. Name for the record, please. Thank you, Tim. Good morning. Afternoon, actually, Good now. Accident. Yeah, thank you. At this point. <sighs> Peace. Justice Raji, um, I'm director of the Reimagine Oregon Project. Are we, is the clock starting? Are we, okay. Um, of many things I can say today, the first thing I'm going to start with, none of this was necessary. Someone I respect highly here, and I won't say their name because I didn't ask them to quote them in a public arena, but they said to me many years ago, to get anything done in this city, black people have to raise hell. It's totally unnecessary. None of this was required. If folks had questions about intention, practice, structure, who's involved, where to go, when to do it, how we're going to do it, why we're here, all you had to do was ask. I don't miss meetings. I, my entire professional career is serving people in much more dire situations than is happening in this room right now. It's been centered on my capacity to show up when called. I don't miss meetings. I don't dodge people if they got a question. I don't mind having an argument. We can go all day. I don't mind having a difference of opinion on how public resources should be spent. Even if I don't agree with you, hey, let's go through the process and get where we got to get to because the benefit on the other side to the people who need it is what is most important. My life is about the work, all right? Understand when these things happen, there's an implication that there was an intention of graft to misappropriate, to redirect for some cause other than the stated cause. Don't play on my name. I mean that. I live my whole life based on my name. My name is Justice for a reason. I didn't get this title just because my mom happened to like it. That's not how it got here, right? Now that's another discussion, but please, if someone needs to talk to me, if someone has a question about this project, call. There's no need for all of this. This creates harm, not just for me personally. If I was another organization that was just starting some work, whether I was a nonprofit or a business, I'd be terrified to work with the city of Portland. I'd be terrified if Portland said, hey, we want to help you get that bigger over there, what you're doing. We saw it. We love it. I'd be absolutely, I would avoid it. Because who wants to come down here and have this argument? Who wants to take time out of their day when I'm supposed to be doing other things? Who wants to take time out of their week, calling all over the city to let you know, hey, actually, Justice has a good reputation. Oh, the people involved in Reimagine Oregon have been serious and above board throughout. No one needed to do this, okay? Let's get the work done. If there's a difference about what the work is, fine. But we don't need to play these games I appreciate the change. I appreciate sticking to the plan. Let's collaborate and get the work done. Thank you. 
Next up, we have Marcus Mundy. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, commissioners. Um, things have been moving quickly in the last week or so, and so you'll, my name is Marcus Mundy. I'm the executive director of the Coalition of Communities of Color. Uh, yeah, things have been moving quickly. You'll get my stream of consciousness comments. They're all over the place, but, uh, uh, and I really hate to follow justice right now, but that's all right, that's all right. Hopefully the tone of my free speech uh, today won't be as uh, reprehensible as Multnomah Village. But anyway, uh, I'm here again to testify in support of Reimagine Oregon. I think I'll abbreviate some of these comments about keeping, you know, I was, I was heartened by the testimony I heard, the uh, amendments I heard today from Commissioner Rubio and Commissioner Ryan. Um, I still remain chagrined that I have to come and testify multiple times to fight for funding that was previously approved. Uh, but I'm hopeful about uh, your ability as a council to uh, listen to community. Last week's comments from the mayor and, the commi and Commissioner Rubio demonstrated their deep understanding of the issues, history, person, uh, purpose, and uh, raison d'etre of uh, funding Reimagine Oregon. Uh, the level and nature of questioning by the commissioner and uh, the earlier silence of two other commissioners made it clear to me that the same knowledge was not universal on this council. I'm heartened again today by uh, the, the stance and the comments of Commissioner Ryan. He did reach out to community, as Justice just urged. He did reach out to community, had those conversations, and was more informed and could make a better decision. Uh, I had tried to figure out last week the reasons why uh, we were here and, and why some were so desirous of the shift. I, I came up with all sorts of stuff. You know, was, was it to appease the neighborhood associations, the usual beneficiaries? Was it to placate business, which was curious to me because business will, bat, will grow from this. Black business, but business will grow. Economic opportunity grows. Um, was it ignorance of the black community? or the concept of targeted universalism, almost certainly. But even with that, there were other misperceptions. Was it trust? Is that too much money for black folks to handle? I don't know. Uh, was it a zero sum perception? If blacks win, we lose. That's a false construct, but the danger is that those perceptions become reality. So uh, to shift dollars so cavalierly without having done the commensurate homework is not as conversation with one of your chiefs of staff mentioned this morning, a good faith effort between the public and the commissioners. Um, lots more to say, but I, I would just say that, that uh, to do that under the, under the guise of public safety or some other red herring is inappropriate. If you reach out to this community and speak with this community, you will get answers. So again, I urge this council to approve the amendments put forth by Commissioners Ryan and Rubio. Thank you. All right. Very good. Colleagues, any further discussion before we go to the roll? All right. Uh, first, we'll call the roll on Wheeler Amendment 1. Just as a reminder, this is a motion to amend the spring bump to add findings and directives to continue services with the impact reduction team. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, please call the roll on the amendment. Wheeler, one. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Amendment Wheeler, one is on the table. Please call the, I'm oh, sorry, Rubio, one is the motion to repeal Maps Amendment 2, which will adjust the supplemental budget to ensure transfer of carryover funds in the Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund for Reimagine Oregon for $4,887,388 and guarantee the transference of the Recreational Cannabis Fund and its administrative uh, from the Civic Life, from, uh, Civic Life to Prosper Portland by July, 20, July 1st, 2023, and all the rest. Any further discussion on Rubio 1? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. I am a no on this amendment. There are too many important process and compliance questions for me and as elected steward of taxpayer dollars, feel comfortable supporting this. Whether we imagine Oregon or the city is substantially at fault for process compliance coming to date is immaterial to me at this point. The remedy is not to point fingers, but to pull back these funds for now, run a transparent process, then allocate these funds in good faith to support 
worthy causes that are consistent with city code. So I vote no on this amendment because it fails to remedy the problems that have been given rise to this mess in the first place, a process and lack of clarity as to the intended purpose. We can and must do better for the diverse communities of Portland and for all our taxpayers. Thank you. Maps. Um, I'm a no on the Rubio amendment. Um, I'm frankly kind of horrified by the, the paperwork um, involved with this um, and have been for years. Uh, literally what we're voting on is uh, bump request 175577 which is described as community-led budgeting. Um, I'm told that, uh, ignore the title, um, actually community-led budgeting doesn't refer to this cannabis, this pot of $4. million in cannabis funds, it actually refers to this $1.5 million in general funds. Um, you know, if I was an accountant and if I was a lawyer, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sign this, and I wouldn't advise my my clients to to sign this. Um, clearly, um, something has gone uh, terribly wrong here, and has stayed terribly wrong here for a long time. Um, I do really want to call out and recognize my colleagues. I I, I totally do see how the see how they are trying to clean this up. Uh, however, uh, I think reverting uh, the mechanism we're using here to revert back to what is, I guess, a mislabeled um, document um, strikes me as just being bad policy, bad work, and I, I won't sign off on it, no. Rubio. Very happy to get this back on track. We make policy decisions, direction decisions, allocations every single day of this job, and this was one of those every single day decisions, and there is no reason why it should be treated or scrutinized any differently than any other decision. Um, and we are, it has been scrutinized to the exact same degree of, of every other decision. We are here to get this on track. We are here to fulfill our commitment to community. I'm very, very proud to vote, aye. Wheeler. So uh, a small point and then what I hope is a larger point. Um, the small point is there is a fundamental difference from a budgeting law perspective between participatory budgeting and community budgeting. This refers to community budgeting. Community budgeting can mean a great many things, including community engagement or working with an organization like Reimagine Oregon or any other uh, uh, program we choose to work with. Participatory budgeting is general fund dollars, and that is a completely different process. That is an organization as opposed to a process. And so I want to make that point because it's important to clarify that for the record because there's allegations of illegal conduct and everything else here that absolutely have no merit whatsoever. Second of all, the larger point is we made a commitment. This council already made a commitment. We already acknowledged uh, the commissioner staff said February, I said January. I don't remember exactly when it was, but the bottom line is we passed unanimously a resolution as part of the 90-day reset that acknowledged that this program needed to get dollars out the door. And what this council unanimously agreed to do was to take those resources out of one bureau's budget and put them into a different bureau's budget with somebody specifically responsible for the process and the allocation of those dollars. And we heard from Ms. Vickers, who, who is that individual. And she has, you know, I know her and I trust her and I think she's great and she knows she has accountability. And we agreed to a process whereby she would engage and then come back to the council and report to us exactly what is the plan for those dollars. What's not in dispute is it took too long. It took too long. And uh, we heard a lot of testimony last week about, you know, whose fault is that? Uh, I think it's kind of all of our fault. It's certainly the city's fault that we had those dollars, we had them locked up, we put them in one of our budgets, and if we thought it was moving too slowly, we had two years in which any of us could have acted to speed that process up, and we did not do so until we got to the January slash February resolution 90 day reset, where we agreed on a strategy moving forward. And I was perfectly satisfied with that solution. 
And as best as I could tell, based on the April 10th letter I received from Justice, reimagine Oregon was perfectly satisfied. And we were on our way. But because we're the Portland City Council, we just had to grasp defeat from the jaws of victory. The bigger point here is people don't trust us. They don't trust their local government. And this is one more reason why. And Justice and I, we disagree from time to time. We have good disagreements. He's a tough guy to have a disagreement with because he's a good debater. And I appreciate that about you, sir. Um, but on this issue, uh, we, we don't disagree. I, I feel like we stumbled and we had an opportunity to show the community we trusted them. And we, through last week's actions, the, the council went in a different direction. And uh, I'm saddened by that. This, this should have been a slam dunk spring bump budget, just like all the others. You know, boring, straightforward, technical adjustments, a few programmatic fixes here and there, reallocating some dollars here and there. Uh, but this became the headline, and I'm disappointed. And so I'm just asking that we as a council aspire to do better by the people who we serve, because they expect a lot from us right now, given that our city is facing multiple crises. So that's a long way of saying I support the amendment. And I know the hearts of my colleagues. They are good people, all of them. They're all here for the right reasons, and they want to do the right thing. And so let's take this moment. Let's all learn from it. I will be introspective as well to think about how I could have done better or could have been more forceful uh, back in January slash February about what the intended purpose of the resolution was that we all voted to support and then see that work through. Uh, but I will vote for this amendment. The amendment carries. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Last but not least, Ryan. Commissioner Ryan, one, this is a motion to make the following adjustments to the supplemental budget as amended to appropriate a transfer cannabis fund resource from the Office of Community and Civic Life to Prosper Portland. Carry them over to fiscal year 23, 24, and the rest. Do you want me to read the details again? No, please, no. <laughs> God, no. Please just call the roll Save before he does it again. <laughs> Ryan. Yeah. Uh, I'm just glad we're, we've cleaned things up and we've acknowledged what's happened and we have the right partners and we're moving forward and let's deliver results. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I'm an eye on this. I appreciate and support moving these dollars from uh, Civic Life over to Prosper Portland. And I'm also glad to see these dollars go out the door to these grantees. For these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The uh, uh, budget, uh, the, the amendment Ryan one passes. Um, so colleagues, uh, I am considering a motion to add an emergency clause to this item, without which due to additional amendments, uh, the bump would pass once again to another second reading next week. I would like to be done with this, but I would like to have a signal from anybody who might vote against the budget is amended because it would require unanimous consent. Is there anybody who does not feel comfortable voting for the budget or is thinking about it? No, I'm fine. Good. Uh, I move that we add an emergency clause to the budget as amended for the purpose of allocating dollars for the remainder of the fiscal year as expeditiously as possible. Second. I have a second from Commissioner Maps. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, please call the roll on the amendment. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. This is now an emergency amendment as amended. Any further discussion on the main motion? Seeing none, please call the roll on the main motion as amended. Ryan. Yeah, colleagues, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in addition to the reimagine Oregon and cannabis tax amendments. I'm really happy to see us honor the intent of the parks levy and ensure that the Bureau's base budget continues to be funded with the resources council allocated for the current fiscal year. I'm also pleased to have the council's support in providing policy set aside funds from the general fund contingency to the parks capital improvement fund to support future uses and activation of O'Brien Square. I vote aye. Gonzalez. 
That's an aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. I want to thank uh, Director Gru and the budget yeah, office sure. for all your terrific work. There's a lot of people in this room who work tirelessly. All of the bureau directors had an important hand in this. I know my staff did, as well as the staff of every single member of this council. Mm -hmm. uh, a ridiculous amount of work for not a whole lot of <laughs> good feelings at the end of the day, but it's important work and we will persevere and we'll move forward and we'll do the good work of the city of Portland. I vote aye. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Thank the you, budget is adopted as amended. Thank, Thank you, you, commissioners. And now for something completely different. Uh, item number 308. Approve findings to authorize an exemption to the competitive bidding requirements and authorize the use of the alternative contracting method of construction manager, general contractor for the council chambers and councilor offices project for an estimated amount of $6,235,000. So unfortunately, if I had any really good talking points for these, this one, I lost them. So I'll just turn this right over to staff. Thank you for being here today. Uh, great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, for the record, my name is Maddie Sauter, and I direct the Division of Asset Management. I'm here today with our Capital Project Supervisor, Randy Selleck, our Capital Project Manager, Caitlin McGeehy. I believe on Zoom are representatives from procurement, in case there are procurement questions, Kathleen brennis Mora and uh, Kelly Davis McKernan. And then Director, uh, Chief Administrative Officer, Mike Jordan, is in the back, in case things get really hairy. Um, so we are here today uh, to request uh, that we be allowed to do a, a, perform a methodology, a certain type of contracting methodology to support the facility investments required to effectuate charter reform. We are here because the methodology is an alternative contracting methodology. So whereas typically we perform design, bid, build projects in which we engage in design, we then go through the bidding process to understand firm bids on the project and then we move into construction and you approve those dollars. Because of the extreme rapidity with which we have to complete the charter reform facility investments, we actually need to mix that up a bit and we need to do something non-traditional. So we are looking for procurement authority to be able to do something called a construction manager general contractor process. And this process allocates and allows us to uh, get general approval for a certain funding amount at the very beginning of the process. And then we engage in a design process, which if you want to flip to the third slide, I think we could just go straight to that, or maybe the fourth slide. Maddie, while, yeah. while you're flipping slides, I found my talking points, and I'm just going to read one <laughs> sentence because Got it. I, I okay. think it's critical. So as you said, this is about accepting a process. This item does not outline a plan for construction. Council will have the opportunity to interact with facilities and the charter transition team in the near future to provide feedback on specific design plans. That's not what this is about. Thank Perfect. you. That's exact, exactly it. So you have in front of you a graphic um, on the left side is traditional design build. Uh, what you don't see is a little arrow between the designer and the contractor. What we are looking for is a different methodology, one that allows for communication between the designer, the construction manager, and the general contractor. So what that allows us to do is essentially hasten the process. It means that while we are doing design, which you will be involved in, including the definition of the scope, timing, et cetera, the normal architectural process, that we will also be allowed to have a contractor, a general contractor there with us who will be performing the work so that they can troubleshoot issues like constructability, timing, supplies, subcontracting, et cetera. So frankly, it just allows for more collaboration, which then hastens the process and could potentially make it more affordable or even easier to figure out different alternatives, which we are still very much trying to ascertain. So for example, um, we would actually really love to construct council chambers in this room versus at the Leah Hing room. We do not think that is technically possible, uh, but being allowed to do this conversation and to have this model of contracting will allow us to much more rapidly assess that outcome. Uh, likewise, we know that there's lots of questions about council offices and whether or not you guys are gonna vacate. Uh, while we do this work, uh, we will be allowed to look at different alternatives, uh, understand how much those alternatives cost, how long they will take, and be able to collectively make an informed decision about how we wanna do this work. Um, so all told, this is simply a method, uh, and it's an approval amount for what we believe will be in scope 
uh, we've completed our pre-design phase, but not design itself. And um, if we're allowed to move forward, we will commence with that RFP. It's actually already drafted and ready to go. And uh, then you will be engaged in the design process, which is coming up in you know probably May, June. Questions? Great. Colleagues, any questions at this particular juncture? It was so thorough. No questions. Uh, do we have uh, public testimony on this item? No one signed up. All right. Well, this is an emergency ordinance. And so please call the roll. Ryan. Thank you for the presentation. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Thanks for your work. I vote aye. Wheeler. Uh, thanks for the good work up to this point. I know the hard part is the next step, right? <laughs> so uh, we'll just send you on your way with, with minimal conflict and wish you the very best as you move forward with this. Uh, and I'm really excited uh, to participate with you on this and, and brainstorm. It'll be a lot of fun and interesting work, I think. Thanks for your hard work. I vote I. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 309, also an emergency ordinance. Authorized price agreement to purchase temporary shelter operation services for amount not to exceed $50 million over five years. I'm, I'm having a momentary uh, uh, moment of guilt. I forgot to ask on 309 if there was public testimony. Was there? Mayor, we're on 309 now. I mean 308. 308. Was there? Was yeah, there, there was, there no was not. Okay, good. Yeah, if there thanks. had been, I, I still would have wanted to hear it. Uh, so 309. You've already read it, correct? As part of our ongoing efforts to address the rampant rates of unsheltered homelessness in our city, this ordinance will allow the city to access shelter operation services as we stand up temporary alternative shelter sites over the next several months. These services are key to providing and maintaining shelter that is humane, hygienic, and safe. I would be remiss not to mention that the state recently approved funding for capital and operational cost for our first temporary alternative shelter site. We're extremely grateful to Governor Kotek as well as our county partners, including County Chair Jessica Vega-Peterson. We look forward to continuing to partner with the multi-agency coordination group as we move this project forward. We have Procurement Services Supervisor Jeff Blade here to walk us through the ordinance. I see Jeff is online. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we did a solicit competitive solicitation for these services back in January. We received two proposals, one from Simply Human and one from Urban Alchemy. We had five evaluators evaluate those proposals. The highest score proposer was Urban Alchemy, and we're awarding the contract to them for $50 million for a five-year contract. Is that your presentation? <laughs> Um, well, it's for temporary shelter operation services. Okay. Um, no, I'm not we, complaining. Believe me, no, brevity yeah. is a good thing. I just wanted to make sure before I jumped in. Very good. Colleagues, yeah. any questions? Any questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, will the, this is a big move. Uh, but frankly, it represents a significant departure in the city's approach to housing our most vulnerable neighbors. Um, will this, um, will the serve, services pro provided here be supported by uh, Multnomah County? What does the county play a role in the in the, in the yeah, services so, we're setting uh, up? Let, let, let me handle that one. Um, so the answer is yes. Okay. Um, what this will do this uh, and to be clear this is an up to yeah. ordinance so this is not allocating 50 million dollars for this purpose. This just gives us the authorization to do it as the plans unfold but I can tell you um, without sharing any great state secrets that we're in uh, extensive and regular communication with the county. We are working specifically on a shared both uh, financing as well as service model whereby we would do a lot of the construction. We would site the facilities. We would do community engagement. The county would provide the services that they're really good at, behavioral health services, connection to substance use disorder treatment programs, uh, basic health care. And, and the part that, that frankly I think is the most important part is their navigation services into uh, better conditions, particularly housing. And so uh, this gives us 
the financial flexibility to be able to fund the model as those partnerships come <laughs> to the forefront. And I, I don't want to put Skylar on the, the, uh, the hot seat without advance notice, but Skylar, is there anything else you wanted to share or does that pretty much cover it? All right, cool. Uh, one other follow-up question. Um, number one, thanks for the clarification, Mr. Mayor. Uh, number two, will those um, uh, services that the county provides to um, these facilities uh, be described in the um, IGA between the city and the county that describes what the joint office does? I think that is not yet determined uh, because the IGA between the city and the county on the joint office is specific to the agreements around the joint office and its operations, it doesn't necessarily get to the programmatic level. Mm. So, so the short answer is no. Okay. Um, I, I, I might like to have some additional dialogue about what's appropriate to put in the contract. Absolutely. With, yeah. with the IGA. 100%, 100 joint happy office, to do that. Well, I'll keep moving. Good. Uh, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez. Thank you. So just mostly for those listening at home, uh, it, can you walk us through the non-shelter services that are envisioned to be provided by Alchemy at these locations? And the, the importance here is that when folks look at the number of people served, they're gonna do the math of how much it's gonna cost per, per client, right? Um, and so just to high level, what security is gonna be provided? Well, we're looking to provide other services with the county such as navigation teams, what will, I understand Alchemy will be doing some of the initial uh, connecting with social services. So maybe just walk through for myself and for those listening at home, the non-shelter services that will be provided on site. Yeah, and, and just to, to, and Commissioner Gonzalez, thank you for raising this. Uh, and and I, I probably should have raised it up front myself because it's, it's always a major talking point. People take the total allocation, they look at how many pods there are, they divide it into it, and they say, oh my gosh, I could rent you know, the nicest condo in the Pearl District for this amount of money. Um, the same is true if you took an operating bed in a hospital and divided it by the total cost of the operations of said bed. Uh, then you could say, wow, I could actually afford an oceanfront estate in the south of France for that amount of money. Um, this is a throughput model, so it's not per person, it's per pod. And we expect the throughput on those pods to be, you know, the, 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 the aspirational target is 90 days given the lack of affordable housing in our community and the paucity of behavioral health and substance use disorder services. It'll probably be longer than that, but currently 90 days is, is what Urban Alchemy is able to commit to in other cities where they currently operate. Uh, but I'll turn it over to, to Skylar, and if you could introduce yourself for the record. Yeah, hi, thanks, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Skylar Brocker Knapp. I'm a senior policy advisor for the mayor's team. Um, so, Commissioner, uh, the Urban Alchemy contract will cover the 15 to 1 uh, client to staff ratio that we've talked about before, as well as uh, care coordinators is what Urban Alchemy calls them. So it's folks who are specifically on site every day um, to develop kind of those profiles of folks for what services they need, how who they can be connected to that would help them along their journey into housing and into services. So um, they provide that connection that you mentioned, kind of that first step, um, but it's a continued case management kind of model. Um, and they found that to be effective in other cities, especially to the mayor's point, when we have the vouchers and the resources to connect folks, um, they're really able to make those connections. They obviously can't provide something that doesn't exist, um, but that's why we're working with the county and, uh, and our state partners with the multi-agency coordination group, as well as just county services uh, to provide those connections and make sure that those resources are available. To the mayor's point, we want to make sure there's a throughput and that we're serving folks to the best uh, possible extent. And so to the extent we could probably call that connection with longer term services, it may not be a clinical social worker, um, but is deliberate in, in looking to get these folks into the through, throughput, uh, so to speak, as the mayor described it. 
Correct, and I think um, one of their kind of secret sauce mechanisms is to have those folks on site every day. So um, I've visited a number of sites in California and you really see folks asking questions to those care coordinators. Um, they can pull them aside at any moment, ask about uh, where's my housing placement at, what do I need, what paperwork do I need to fill out. Um, someone called me with a question, how do I answer this, how do I get connected um, to any kind of those behavioral mental health services, my primary care doctor, um, get me on Medicaid, those kinds of things. So it's, it's that continued connection, that relationship building that they found to be effective. And could just you speak high level to anticipate security that's going to be provided under this contract as well as uh, food services that are going to be provided under this, con under this contract? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Urban Alchemy calls it engagement. They don't um, provide security services, but they have a lot of staff uh, at the site um, watching what's going on, making sure they're engaging with folks, de-escalating um, any violent kind of situations or um, disagreements, basically. They also do engagement in the surrounding area, so not just specifically in the site, but also around it. So they have, um, we, part of that contract is paying for two urban alchemy professionals to uh, be around the site, walking, engaging with folks um, all day. And then there's two shifts, obviously, so it's about 16 hours a day um, where folks are engaging in the surrounding area of the site. Um, so that's, you know, folks who um, might be like, just walking around, they can engage with them. Residents, they could just engage with them if they have questions. Business owners, they can engage with them as well to make sure all folks' questions are answered and they're just providing more of that engagement process. Um, so I think they wouldn't call it security per se, but I think it's just a level of engagement, foot traffic, really just being available to the community in the surrounding area. And could you highlight uh, food services as well, what's planned to be provided on site? Yeah, so that would be a subcontract with Urban Alchemy. We've had actually, I would say, four or five uh, nonprofit food service providers who've reached out. We've connected them with Urban Alchemy, and they're looking to partner with them for on-site services. There will likely be different contracts uh, with Urban Alchemy at each of the sites. So they'll make that determination. Um, we've told them we like, would like uh, two meals and a snack provided every single day. Got it. And one last question, just to make tangible your point about the engagement. So if Urban Alchemy witnesses hard drug sales adjacent to a, a location of one of these, um, you know, uh, human trafficking or other criminal behaviors, what's in your mind, what is their expected services in that model? What is, how will they uh, engage with public safety in that model? Yeah, um, I would expect that they would call 911, like I would expect anyone who kind of sees um, those actions taking place anywhere in the community. Um, and, you know, I think they've said they've done that in other cities. Um, they'll partner um, with police when necessary. They would prefer not to engage with that, but the level of crime that you're describing, I think, would require a 911 uh, call. Okay, thank you. Th yeah. Thank you for your time. Any other questions at this juncture? Public testimony? We have 13 we have... people signed up. Very good. First up, we have Caitlin Day. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Hi. I'm ready whenever. Oh, yeah. Please go ahead. Wonderful. Yeah. So, hi. Um, my name is Caitlin. I'll get right to the point. Um, I don't support going forward with this resolution. I also am aware that you probably are going to vote it through. So, I do want to at least give a little bit of context of or how Urban Alchemy has operated in other cities. Um, so, you talked a lot about how they don't provide security and rather do engagements. Um, but I want to say just because they don't call it security doesn't mean it isn't security. And this has been a big point of contention in California. And so this is a bit of a question for me. If they are going to do anything that resembles security, what kind of oversight or accountability mechanisms are there going to be? In particular, are they going to register with DPSST? Um, because again, just because they call it a different name doesn't mean that's not what it is. Um, so that's a major concern for me. I also want to talk about how Urban Alchemy is making claims about how a lot of their model is they're able to put people into housing. They're saying it's very, which is very aspirational, like you said, that they can put people into housing in 90 days. Um, 
But I also want to point out that they have a history of fudging some of those numbers, which they did in Los Angeles. And that's not something we're just making up right now. Like, there's proof that they were fudging numbers. After the Echo Park Lake sweep, where hundreds of people got displaced, they said, I have it here, that, and they proudly announced it on Twitter and in a press conference that they got 166 people into housing. Um, well, UCLA did a survey of all the people in Echo Park Lake who supposedly got housing. And as it turns out, of the 183 people who were placed on a housing list, only 17 people were actually placed in housing. And of those 17 people, only five were placed in permanent housing. Um, and that's something that concerns me because this has also been something that's happened here um, with some of the reporting in Multnomah County of our numbers have been inflated that we're getting a lot of people into housing, but that's because we're just listing that we're putting people onto a housing list. And so I am a little, I am a little skeptical about their reporting mechanisms, and I feel like we're going to see a lot of inflated numbers to show that this program's actually working when it's not actually working. And that's something that really concerns me. And I guess the last thing I just want to say is that we know that how this even came to be in the first place was Urban Alchemy was in talks with the mayor's office for months about this. And I know there was a competitive bidding process, but it's pretty clear just judging by how the RFP was drafted that this, this was created for Urban Alchemy. And they are trying to expand nationwide and put this model everywhere, but I haven't seen it work anywhere and I don't think it's going to work here. So that's all I have. Great, thank you. And I, I'm not gonna respond to each person, but I am making a list and I'll, I'll respond at the end. Thank okay. you, appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Next up we have David Bagley. I believe David was gonna join us online. I don't see them, so we'll move on to Keely Higgins. Welcome, thank you for being here. So I think it's an accurate assumption that the city council isn't super familiar with the concept of mutual aid and it's fairly obvious. They all don't know what real community engagement looks like. The first thing you do when addressing a challenge or constructing a project is you look around. You look to see if anyone else is doing the same work. You talk to people who are doing similar work. You engage with those who are directly impacted by the work. And if there's redundancy, you then work together and add what you can. Giving an out-of-state nonprofit like Urban Alchemy $50 million or up to $50 million is the antithesis of this concept. Set aside the very serious issues with Urban Alchemy, the multiple sexual assault allegations, the wage theft suits, the $10,000 that UA and the city of San Francisco just paid out to a civilian for forcibly removing them from a public space for praying while being trans and perceived as homeless. While UA is not a licensed security company, their staff's responsibilities include patrolling public spaces. By calling these employees ambassadors, they are able to bypass rules that define private security and policing. That, combined with reported poor training, has very clearly caused harm to the most vulnerable of community members. On UA's website, their mission statement includes the following. When a neighborhood, street, or intersection earns a reputation as a place to avoid, we turn it around. Urban Alchemy is a peaceful and supportive presence, inviting communities to rebuild and restore a sense of pride and respect in urban spaces. Can we all notice how there is not one mention of respect or dignity or autonomy for a human in that statement? I see how this is appealing to the city council, as you've proven time and time again that property means more to you than human life, but to us it reads as prioritizing how city spaces are perceived at best and dehumanization at worst. Now I know 50 million is a drop in the bucket for you, Ted, and your boys. Shoot, it's less than a quarter of the total, amount, uh, total annual budget for your power-tripping violent gang of fascists. Sorry, I mean upholders of white supremacy. Sorry, I mean the Portland police. You could use these emergency funds to support local nonprofits like Sisters of the Road or Blanchett House, bolster programs like the ERA that helps folks face eviction, or a street response team. You could put this money toward harm reduction initiatives and recovery inpatient treatments, mental health facilities. You could do what those with lived experiences and those who work within disenfranchised communities have been asking for. You could build and provide housing Permanent housing, for example, assuming 150K per unit investment leverage with other funds could create 333 permanent homes. Or just give people money. 
It's been proven in real life scenarios and studies that giving folks experiencing houselessness direct funds leads to permanent housing and job placements within six months to a year with success rates in the 80th and 90th percentile. Not for nothing in a single year in LA, only five out of 261 residents of a UA site found permanent housing. Let's break it down. 50 million comes to 27,397 a day for five years, which could be 1,000 a month for 800 people for five years. I know I'm at my time. I acknowledge these are larger big picture solutions that require more than budgeting. They require building a sustainable infrastructure that looks very unfamiliar compared to the current faulty systems we have in place now. So I'll end my time with some quick solutions that make a far greater impact than your poorly thought out Band-Aid. So, Stop the goddamn sweeps. Right, Lift Caitlin, the tent and tarp thank ban. You. Stop criminalizing homelessness. Thank you. Next up, we have Songa Mabaklin. Hmm. Songa, you're muted. There you go. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Okay. Uh, we are on stolen land. I just want to say that. Secondly, I concur with the people that just spoke. And y'all had a plan. All are we listening to are liars, thieves, and colonizers. How long, Ted, have you lied? How long have y'all pretended to care? And how long do you be in the beds with the same people you have contracts with all the time? This is how you hold discussion about one of your own council members saying that you are doing things illegal. This is things we are. No. What is your accountability, Ted? You're talking about the people in the first person. What about you, Ted, and the council members? What is going to happen to you that you fail the community over and over and over and over again? You've lied over and over again. You have the solutions to houses. You won't give people money because you're making money. You're the police commissioner and you're the mayor and you love to say you boast about it and you know that's a conflict conflict of interest you boast about being a white supremacist you boast about tear gassing up you boast about being the person that kicks people out and do sweeps you boast about these things because you think you're something that can't be crushed but we are the people and we're going to take those seats that you do not own, that you, you do not have the right to have because all you think you do is line your pockets with money that you get from the taxpayers. Then you sit and say, we like to hear your feedback because we want to know, take your opinions in consideration. You take nothing in consideration but yourself to how you can get rich you have the solution you have every solution to every problem that you created as a colonizer but you keep creating these problems so you can keep being rich so you can keep being ted weaver which your whole family is white supremacy the people sitting next to you is white supremacy but you sit here and act like oh i'm not white supremacy i'm trying to help you're not trying to do nothing but help yourself to getting rich but we're letting you know as the people we're outing you and we're outing everyone that conspire to the things that you are trying to do and parallelism is going on now and you are too and everyone around you because the people will take over and you will have nothing to say but Ted Wheeler you were the problem and you need to understand that we're not going to stop until we solve our problem of white supremacy in Portland, Oregon. You home rule, have a good day and we're coming for you. Woo! Next up we have Tim McCormick. Welcome Tim. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear, thanks Tim. Uh, good morning, Mayor, Council members, and City staff. Uh, my name is Tim McCormick. I'm the Director of Housing Alternatives Network in Portland. I've been working for quite a few years with various nonprofits and builders on new low-cost shelter and housing approaches, particularly those opened up by new laws such as Shelter to Housing Continuum and HB 2001. I believe we have not just a crisis or chronic failing in front of us, 
but a tremendous opportunity and calling to create out of this embattled situation responses that are uniquely Portland and transformative. We need new responses because as the Oregonian presented on March 13, uh, they, they said, well, essentially the problem is, is that you won't get the thoroughput of people uh, with our present rate of housing creation or opening. They said as of February 6, fewer than 2% of people served at Los Angeles Urban Alchemy site and transitioned to permanent housing. Well, I'd like to ask you to imagine today a, a different approach for shelter sites and future affordable housing, a new creative angle. That is to ask ourselves and pilot, how can we move away from temporary pods and placings and make a more sustainable investment in the cities and in unhoused people's futures with what I'm calling a Portland pad model, portable, affordable dwelling. That is very basic, low barrier to entry, new housing that is movable, rapid deployable and low cost like pallet shelters or pods, but is upgradable, expandable and recitable to permanent housing. It could evolve into long-term and even a type of ownership housing if the resident wished it. For example, as a cottage in a cottage cluster or backyard. This essentially is an answer to that basic question, what is the food cart of housing? Beloved, local, portable, adaptable launch pad for great cuisine and local genius. Food carts are not just cheaper, smaller restaurants. They're a key way our cuisine and city are open and transformative and how people can start from almost nothing and build into permanent businesses and restaurants. The Portland pad model that I propose based on work I've done over years with local organizations is likewise to innovatively provide key missing rungs of and a bridge onto the housing ladder. It's like a lower rung to and might be developed alongside the innovative mass casitas being developed at Port of Portland T2 by Hacienda CDC. You can see more of this envisioning in my written testimony, which is also available at pad.tmccormick.org. Thank you for imagining our city needs it. To dare is to do. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Next up, we have David Bickman. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. All right, terrific. Um, Thank you, Council, for the chance to testify on this um, important subject. My name is David Bickman, and I'm here um, in opposition to um, granting this contract. Um, I know I speak for a lot of folks who can't um, be here for um, professional or personal reasons. There is um, a lot of smart folks have, have looked at this and have concluded that this is the wrong approach for Portland. It's not in alignment with uh, Portland values. Um, it's uh, reaching out to this um, out of state, you know, cookie cutter chain organization uh, that has no relationships, no expertise in Portland, um, and expecting them to do um, housing placements in 90 days, I think, is, um, is, is really not reasonable at all. So I, I, I wanted to point out a, a couple of things. One, uh, I, I was very involved in the village coalition during a period when we accomplished a lot, including establishing the Kenton Women's Village. This was, to my knowledge, the only time that a neighborhood engagement process resulted in a neighborhood voting positively, proactively saying, yes, bring in your temporary alternative shelter project, bring in your village to this neighborhood. And in fact, we're ready to support and embrace it. And that's what's happened. So. Portland has an incredibly rich array of public and private sector actors, folks in the university system, folks in the, in, in, in the, in the faith system who are ready to produce uh, living situations that promote human flourishing, right? An outdoor prison camp does not promote human flourishing. People don't transition out of tents. Um, we keep hearing $50 million. That's incorrect. Your proposal is actually to spend $75 million uh, when you take into account the city's direct costs uh, for land and 
operations. If we assume maximum capacity, full occupancy, and give urban alchemy all of, all of the generous assumptions, then we're looking at um, 750 people served. That's according to their RFP. I read the, the, the RFP. They say we can, we can serve five sites, 150 folks a site. Um, that's $100,000 a person. That's $100,000 a tent, right? And we're not talking about pods. We're talking about 50 pods is what they can they commit to in the RFP. So everything else is tents. We're talking about $100,000 tents. I hope journalists are listening and can check my math because um, the numbers I'm seeing here, they, just donate, they don't add up. It's really loony. Um, so please turn to Portland instead of California. We can do this together. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Andrew Olshan. Hey, Long good morning. Day, huh? Good afternoon, actually. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Andy Olshan. Uh, thank you all for your public service. Special thanks to Commissioner Ryan for his determined uphill efforts to develop the Safe Rest Villages. Uh, thank you, brother. And thank you for honoring the memory of Nick Fish and that work. And to Mayor Wheeler for remembering our sidewalks, parks, and other spaces belong to all Portlanders and for bringing urban alchemy to our city. I'm the founder and executive director of Cascadia Clusters. We're a six-year-old 501c3 nonprofit. We develop and implement collaborative, nonprofit, faith, foundation, and private sector housing-related projects, focusing on training houseless individuals in the construction trades. Sometimes we include local government, although that tends to slow things down. We are here today to enthusiastically and optimistically express our support for what we see as a new and improved entry point to our affordable housing continuum. We've met and spoken with representatives of Urban Alchemy and believe they will meet our houseless neighbors where they are at, respect who they are, and share their experience, strength, and hope with them. In other words, they get it. We believe this can work at scale as proposed by Urban Alchemy. Why? Three reasons. One, under this contract, six new villages will be operated and managed by people who have lived experience in poverty and homelessness, addiction, and incarceration. That's who Urban Alchemy is. Because smaller, intentional, self-governed communities have worked and continue to work in Portlandia, that's Dignity Village, R2D2, Hazelnut Grove, and Urban Alchemy has already shown an openness and a willingness to partner with locally grown organizations that have been working and living on our streets for decades. We're also here to point out a missing piece in the agreement between Urban Alchemy and the city and offer a solution. The 50 plus page agreement uh, requires Urban Alchemy to meet and report on its efforts to connect residents with employment, yet does not employ, uh, provide any resources for them to do so. <coughs> We'd like to help. If welcomed by Urban Alchemy, and I've already talked with them about some of this stuff, we will donate a 25-foot enclosed tractor trailer and work with them to convert it into a mobile sheltered workshop and solar microgrid workshop, which you saw at our uh, one of the C3PO villages, um, so that residents in the Clinton Triangle Village can use this workshop to build some of the items that I passed around in what you've got in front of you. Um, we've worked with 60 houseless individuals in the last five years that we've trained. We've built picnic tables, benches. We built the Beacon Village, Agape Village, um, Hazelnut Grove, and I will just take my answers off the air. Thank you for being here, appreciate it. Next up, we have Jesse Presley Grusin. They were going to join us online. Or is Jesse here? Oh, okay, we'll go on to Rhea Hannon. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Ray Hannon, and I'm on the systemic change team at Sisters of the Road. I'm here today to urge you not to authorize the proposed price agreement with Urban Alchemy. We crunched the numbers. 
we attended town halls, and we even met with Urban Alchemy. And all of these factors considered, we believe that this financial decision is an unsustainable and wasteful use of community resources. Sanctioned encampments will not solve the housing crisis, nor will they make housing more affordable. Instead of this brash and disappointing plan, you could choose to support initiatives that will actually reduce houselessness. Consider ballot measure 26238, eviction representation for all, which will reduce unjust evictions and keep Portlanders housed. Consider supporting legislation like Senate Bill 611 or House Bill 3503 that will ensure housing is affordable and attainable for all Oregonians. Consider additional measures that are real systemic solutions rather than spending $20 million annually to keep unhoused Portlanders out of sight. The current proposal for these sanctioned encampments costs far more than providing actual housing for unhoused people. Let me just say that again. It would be cheaper to house people in apartments than it would be to run these camps. So why not approach the issue from a truly housing first model? You stated in the write-up of this agenda item that various temporary alternative shelter sites, including safe dress villages, will utilize this contract. Do you plan to have Urban Alchemy, a San Francisco-based organization that has no roots in Portland, run Portland's current Safe Press Villages too? Before bringing an organization rife with controversy into our city, did you plan to invite anyone with lived experience to San Francisco to tour Urban Alchemy shelter sites or just members of the Portland Business Alliance and fellow commissioners? Why do our unhoused residents have to go through a more arduous process to prove they are ready for housing than Urban Alchemy had to go through to win this RFP? It's clear where your priorities lie, but I implore you to listen to the people of this city and rethink this plan. Unhoused people do not want to be forced into sanctioned encampments, and advocates and community organizations have opposed this plan from the beginning. Listen to your constituents, your neighbors, and the people, not large corporate interests of Portland. Stop this gross misuse of tax dollars and instead invest in proven, sustainable solutions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, we have Molly Hogan. Good afternoon. And, and by the way, I, I will be responding to a lot of the public testimony at the end of this, because I, I will want to correct the record on some of this. Okay. Um, good morning, Mayor and City Commissioners. Morning. My name is Molly Hogan, and I'm the director of the Welcome Home Coalition. Over 80 organizations united with the common vision that everyone has access to a safe, stable, and affordable home in our region. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this item. Back in fall of 2022, when you launched this plan to institute mass encampments for people experiencing homelessness in our city, you heard from hundreds of people earnestly asking you to pause and not move forward with it. You moved forward with Urban Alchemy, the out-of-state organization that has made a business of setting up mass tent cities around the country as wealth inequality and housing costs rise and more and more people struggle to stay housed. I have no delusions that my testimony today will change your course of action. However, as a coalition that focuses on ensuring everyone has access to a safe, stable, and affordable home in our region, we are acknowledging that your choice to pass an ordinance to spend up to 50 million of taxpayer dollars to warehouse people experiencing homelessness does not work toward furthering the goal of increasing housing access to our most vulnerable residents. Research continues to show that housing people is the most effective policy to address homelessness. Here are some other ways to spend $50 million to address our housing crisis. Using the 2022 Move in Multnomah pilot program costs and number of households successfully served last summer, 50 million spent on that model could subsidize 2,675 households for a year. $50 million put toward affordable housing development, assuming $150,000 per unit investment leveraged with other funds, could create 333 permanent homes that would serve vulnerable Portlanders for decades. $50 million put toward hotel conversion purchases could create new dignified transitional and permanent supportive housing for up to 1,000 people at a time, including families and children. $50 million put toward permanent supportive housing could support around 1,800 households for one year with rent assistance and wraparound services. 
50 million put towards substance abuse recovery inpatient treatment could serve around 850 people. Lastly, as an organization that supports the stories of lived experience, I want to take off my coalition director hat and share a personal perspective. My mother lived outside for a decade. She would not go to congregate shelter settings and preferred her autonomy of camping outside despite the challenges that go with that. What finally stabilized her was a subsidized apartment, which I'm really happy to report she's been living in on her $900 a month income. Investing in rent assistance and affordable housing is life-changing for so many. And what I always think about is that the people living outside are someone's mother like mine. Someone's daughter, sorry, son, father, grandfather, cousin, friend, you get it, a loved one, right? And they deserve to be treated with dignity and given autonomy over their lives while the system works to do better to make housing truly accessible to all. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Eve. Is Eve here? <coughs> Is she online, Keelan? No, no. Um, Benjamin D. Benjamin, welcome back. It's always a pleasure, Mayor. Um, my name is Benjamin D. That's D for Dark Money Propagandist. And I am here today in support of the Urban Alchemy Plan. And I would like to submit to the council clerk for, unless I can approach the bench, uh, these documents. Yeah, she'll, she'll get them to all of us. And uh, unfortunately, I, uh, because uh, Commissioner Vadim is not here, I won't be able to give him one. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Gonzalez, uh, these anti-homeless advocates, they all blur together after a while. Um, so I, I really support Urban Alchemy. I think they bring a much needed benefit for the fascists of our city. I think if you follow the logical conclusion of where this leads as it starts to restrict the freedoms of the people that are the most poor, I think that's great. I mean, we don't want the poor in downtown. We don't want them anywhere near us. We don't want to look at them. We don't want to look at their shanty towns. And I, I think if we look in history, Mary Willer, I don't think I need to, to, to give you a history lesson, but when the last time we had these mass outdoor encampments back in the 20s, uh, they were burned down by the fire firefighters and marshals of the time because they simply could not stand these large congregations of poor people. Uh, that, of course, was under the tenure of the KKK mayor who loved to say things like, we want to make Portland clean, safe, and prosperous. Uh, that's an exact quote. Um, you know, I, I think that if we, and Maps, you probably have my back on this, uh, I think that if we really, really want to punish these people to make them pay, to make them suffer, then we'd go this route, you know, because the liberals are not going to question it. They, they see urban alchemy, we're about security, safety, yada, yada. Uh, we hire black people. That's great, right? They're never going to question it. They're just going to look the other way and say problem solved because they don't have to go downtown and see it anymore. And, uh, you know... What's better than pitting poor people against poor people? You take these convicts, you throw them at the homeless, you say security, you know, that's great. That really maximizes the oppression so that both sides suffer, you know? And uh, I, I just, I, I support it so much that I think the next ones should be in like the West Hills, you know? Let's, let's really trip them up. Let's put the next ones in the, the, the golf clubs. You know, up North Portland, let's go to South Portland and put them in the country club. Let's just get a big giant one, because these people, they don't have your back, Mayor. They don't have your back. At the first sign of trouble, they retreat through their multinational islands elsewhere. They leave their offices and they evacuate the city because they do not have faith in this city the way that you do and the way that this city council does, right? And so I think that if you're an American, if you're truly an American, you believe in American rights, we need to seize from these multinationals all this property that they have accumulated over days, over years, over months, and yada, yada. I, I think it's really time for Portland for Portland, you know? Portland for people. 
Let's take their skyscrapers and just turn them into housing. Problem solved. You will become the best mayor of all time. You have saved this city. will have solved homelessness. And on just one very last note, I know I'm over time. I, I don't know if you saw, but concerning fentanyl, uh, the department, and I don't want to be assassinated for this, but the Department of Justice, they solved the case in San Diego and saw where this fentanyl is coming from, which was the police union. So I, I would recommend to you, Mayor, if you want to solve fentanyl, to write the Department of Justice to do a little investigation here, just to, you know, see what's going on. Uh, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Benjamin. Uh, next up, we have Emily Boyer. Emily, welcome back. Thank you. So, <clears throat> my name is Emily Boyer. I um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I was not planning on speaking, but this is an item about which I feel strongly opposed. Uh, the strength of my emotion today is not just about this um, uh, item, it's also from seeing firsthand over the last, especially two years, the effects of the city's inhumane practices towards the homeless. I live in the outer southeast side and I am familiar with some of the encampments out there and I'll just, I'll, um, Suffice to say, the current practices are um, not working. They're destroying people's lives. We'll say that again for those up in DC. You're destroying people's lives with your current practices towards our homeless, right? So what I wanted to say is that I'm deeply disappointed in a commission that professes to um, value making data different decisions, that you'd support this, this antithesis this antithesis, still here, to data-driven decisions, uh, to the data-supported model of housing first. Doesn't Portland uh, profess to sign on to, um, isn't there a, a national pact to support housing first because it's a data-driven, uh, data-supported model? Is that not the case? Can somebody familiarize me? Maybe afterwards. Okay. Um, some of my other concerns, I'm not going to use my whole time, but um, some of my other concerns uh, include uh, how the bidding process was crafted for this company, the many concerns you've heard from our community about this company, and the way you seem to have disregarded them. I do believe we all see the council's vote today as a foregone conclusion, and that's utterly disappointing. I'm not just disappointed, I'm infuriated at the point to which you disregard your constituents. Just livid. Another of my concerns is the private security. I'm sorry, what is it called? It's called something else. The private security that'll be provided. Uh, we recently had the tragedy of um, fatal shooting of a private security company. I forget their name. It starts with C, Cornerstone, Vanessa Sturgeon her company. We can't afford any more mistakes like that. Like you said recently, one life lost is too many. Can't afford any more mistakes of private security like that. No. I urge you to vote no. I feel utterly defeated in urging you to do so, but I do so in any case. Thank you for Thank the you. opportunity today. That completes testimony. All right, very good. Um, so I, I do have some comments and I'll try to keep these brief um, in no particular order. And I'm sorry that, that this is going to be a little bit um, fragmented. And I'm going to try and consolidate some of my thoughts. First of all, the question is why not just take this money and invest it in housing? After all, for some people it works to go directly from the streets to housing. That's not what this model is about. We will continue to invest in housing. We'll continue to work with our partners at the county, at the metro regional level, at the state. And in fact, when we passed this model through council, it was one of five resolutions. Resolution number one was to jumpstart and get rid of impediments to the creation of low cost housing in our community. So yeah, we're gonna continue to do that but this model was actually designed for a very different population. This model was designed for a population of people who either do not want 
or are not ready to be stable in housing. I heard several people suggest that this, uh, you know, one testifier said it's a prison camp. And we heard from others previously that it's a concentration camp. Uh, I want to be clear, this is completely voluntary. People will be referred into this program. People who it is believed by front line service providers could be successful in this model. They will be the ones referred to this program. If they want to leave, they can leave anytime they want. There's nothing prison about this. And so it's really disconcerting to me that people who are activists who follow this closely, who are the most engaged on these issues are either unwittingly misrepresenting what this model is or worse yet, providing misinformation to the public in an effort to block something that they feel threatened by for reasons that frankly aren't clear to me. Number two, number two, the notion that this is a top-down model, this was actually created with the input of people on the streets. We asked them, what do you need? And this model represents the three things that we heard most commonly. Number one, I don't want to be swept again. Number two, I want access to hygiene. Number, I, I heard you earlier, and now I'm responding to what people have said. You don't have to agree with what I said, but I'm just, I'm responding. Uh, and number three, icing on the cake would be that opportunity to be connected to services, connected to housing, whatever. The question was asked, what's the role of the county in this? And how do you guarantee that there will be housing available so that people can actually transfer out of this situation into housing? That's the weak link in all of this. And we, we've been really transparent up front about that. Uh, that is the weak link. So the agreement we hope to reach with the county is that if you are chronically homeless and you are going into this program and you are connected with the case managers and the support services that can help you get off and stay off the streets, we'll prioritize your connection to housing. The whole model bogs down, and this is where I agree with the testimony, it bogs down if we can't move people out of these uh, out of these uh, situations into in stable housing, I'll be the first to agree. I'll be disappointed. So we have to really redouble our efforts around affordable housing. But I just want to remind people, this is one part of a larger service delivery model. This isn't instead of everything else we're doing. This is an addition to. This fills a gap that people with lived experience tells us exists in our community. And I think it's actually good to support it. The constant question of lives versus property, an ugly truth. The city council is responsible for a number of issues in this community that no other government is responsible for. Public safety, maintenance of public right-of-ways, access to sidewalks, the support of green spaces and parkways. That's part of our job too. And so when the community says we deserve to have access to those spaces, that's part of our job, is to ensure that the public has equal access to public spaces. And it's also notable that when people say, well, no, um, self-determination is the way to go here. Let people block whichever sidewalks they want. I have a question for you. Do you have no sympathy or empathy for people with disabilities uh -huh. who also need access to, well, seriously, if, if you're making that case, I'm raising a legitimate question, and I'm not asking you to answer it today, but I'm asking you to at least think about it. I'll answer um, it. It's not right now. Parts. Not right now. Um, yeah, the the uh, uh, question about um, corporate-driven, that this is a corporate-driven model. I want you to know that while there are many in the business community who support what we're doing, there are many in the business community who oppose what we are doing. This was driven by my perspective that losing over 200 people a year in unsanctioned encampments in our community is not a good thing. I picked my number. My number is zero. And I also agree with those of you who say everything we're doing around the status quo, it's not enough. It's not sufficient. It's leaving too many people falling through the gaps, the, 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 the gaps particularly people who are chronically homeless. Let's try it. 
again, it's voluntary. Let's try it because I believe based on the input we received and the research we've done, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, somebody made a really good point. They, they, they didn't think much of me personally, but they made a point that, that overcomes that. Uh, data driven, data. We don't do a good job. I don't remember who it was specifically who said it, uh, but we don't do a good enough job collecting and disseminating and sharing data about what's working and what isn't working, um, you know, what is the success or not the success. Uh, who, whoever said that, I agree, and that's, that's uh, an important uh, point here. So th those are just, um, yeah, I, I think I've sort of consolidated some of these things. Um, oh, the visibility piece. Somebody said, well, what you're trying to do here uh, is you're, you're trying to hide homelessness. Not at all. In fact, the first encampment where we have now actually been very public, we've, we've signed all the documents, we're ready to go, it's in a very visible, highly visible location. There's no attempt here to hide anything. And uh, by the way, in the city of Portland, it's well known that we have a homeless crisis. This is not secret news to anybody who lives here or anybody who's visited here or anybody who reads any newspaper anywhere in the United States of America. We know we've got a serious problem. And so we're entering into this in good faith with the hope that this model works. We have no monopoly on the truth. We don't know if it will work. But we believe, based on the preponderance of information and evidence and what we're hearing from people who are homeless on our streets, that this has a very good chance of being a successful model. And when I look at where we are today with almost 200 people dying on the streets last year, I'm sitting here going, why the hell wouldn't we try this? That's my comment. I don't know if anybody else has comments or questions. What's the response to the sexual Please assault call the allegations, role. the open civil suits call against urban alchemy? Please stop interrupting. You got your time, and now it's our time. That's the way so the process to works. Respond to the sexual assault allegations. Please call the roll. Ryan. Yeah, thanks for bringing this forward. We definitely need to keep improving our um, point of entry uh, for people who have been chronically homeless for some time and actually get on the ground and serve them. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I appreciate the mayor's leadership on this. It's a vexing complex policy issue for the city of Portland. It is the outcome of a lot of failures in our community and in our society, which leads to the number of unsheltered on our streets. This is hard work. We're not gonna get it perfect out of the gate. This has been thought through. I appreciate the mayor's uh, team's work on it. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Um, there's been a lot of thoughtful, um, you know, consideration, uh, a lot of engagement, partnership with the county. Um, for me, above all, I believe uh, houseless community members should not ever have to be fearful of physical or sexual assault. They need a safe place to sleep at night while they're waiting for services. So I vote aye. Wheeler. Of course, I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Um, colleagues, given the time, the I would city. suggest we move items 3, 10, 11, and 12 to the beginning of our afternoon agenda unless there's any objection. Seeing none, we're adjourned.